Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashrathi, and this is the Eve Universe Show, and this is your complete guide on fittings. So, we have a lot to cover. This is going to be a long episode. I don't even know how long, um, but we are going to be covering everything. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's going to be timestamps below in order to kind of break everything down. But w the goal here is that we are going to cover everything I can possibly think of when it comes to knowledge about fittings, modules, and how it all works in one video uh, broken down in some semblance of an order. So I have an outline here, I have notes, I have copious amounts of research that I've done, and we're going to be looking up stuff and using the compare tool throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation. And uh, let's just jump into it, okay? So the methodology is we're going to talk first and foremost, before you do any kind of fitting, you're going to start with a ship. Now, one of the things to think about even at this point, is that a lot of people come to me with the ship that they want to use and then ask to fit it without the task by which it will be used on. All ship fittings, all fittings, period, should be designed for the task that it is meant to do, right? So you should always start with the task. What is it that you want to do with it? Now, you can ask what kind of tasks are a certain ship good for? Um, or, or specialized in, but in general, you want to start with what it's going to do. Then you want to figure out what hull you want to use and what fit you want to use. But all fittings begin with a ship. So we're going to open up the ship browser by going up to ship, the ship tree. And this is almost all of the ships in the game. There are a few ships that are not visible on the ship tree. The four primary races are the first four with the Amar, the Kaldari, the Galente, and the Mimitar. Uh, and they have their own specialties. We'll talk about that in a little bit. As well as the pirate ships, pirate ships, the non-Empire ships of uh, Outer Ring Excavation, which have mining and hauling, or well, mostly mining and industrial. Uh, the Garistas, the Sa Sanchez Nation, Blood Raiders, Angel Cartel, Serpentis, Sisters of Eve Exp Exploration, Mortis Legion, Triglavian, and Edencom. Okay, so each of these kinds of ships, um, they have kind of, if you notice, they have the same sort of breakdown. All four empires have roughly the same ship classes, right? Each empire has the same ships, but it's like their own take on it. First and foremost, right? So like each race will have an interceptor, for example, actually two interceptors. And so each race has their own take on the two interceptors, first and foremost. So there aren't very many ships that are like unique to a specific race per se. Uh, the ship roles span across the major empires. Now, when it comes to pirate ships, they're a lot more restrictive. And in general, you've got a frigate, a cruiser and a battleship for each of the pirate uh, types with some capitals depending on the pirate kind, um, but we're not going to worry too much about those now. Uh, a lot of the different pirate groups only have the frigate, cruiser, the battleship. A uh, few exceptions would or would be the outer ring excavations, because they're the mining barges, the industrial ships, so they have their own line completely. The Triglavian ships are a much more fleshed out group than a lot of the other pirate ships, with almost a full T1 line. Uh, actually, I think that is a full T1 line and uh, even some T2. And then the Edencom ships are, are way closer to normal pirates with a frigate, cruiser, battleship. Anywho, uh, as far as the roles go, when it comes to uh, how ships are arranged, you have, as you go further to the right of this flip ship tree, the ships get bigger. And as you go to the left, or as you go up, they get more advanced, okay? So on this baseline here, this is going to be the Tech 1 ships, which is the basic ships that alphas can use. As you can see, everything above the Navy line, it has this little Omega symbol there. That means that these can only be trained with skills that can only be trained, or those can, these can only be used by a sk by, uh, with sh skills that can only be trained by Omega, which would be the... Uh, the paid for account, right? So these, everything, the Navy and the tech ones, all the ones down here up to battleship are the ones that alphas or free to play can use. Okay. Now in general, tech one is the flexible version, right? It is uh, a bit more generic 
and it is, uh, you know, obviously weaker. It has less of a stat allocation than a lot of the other uh, more advanced versions, but it is also more general. In in general, you can have um, uh, you can use them outside of their normal use better. Uh, now, navy. This is not always true. There are some exceptions throughout the line. But in general, and we'll see this throughout the entire setup, in general, Navy ships are uh, better at application and have better defenses, usually more hit points or whatnot. So like, for instance, this Apocalypse Navy issue has a tracking speed bonus. Tracking speed allows you to hit better, so that'd be considered application. Um, As I said, there's a couple of exceptions. The biggest exception is that each race has a Navy uh, E-War frigate electronic warfare front frigate that takes that empire's electronic warfare style and uses it in close range. We're going to talk about the different empires, electronic warfare styles in a little while. But uh, as you can see, the Navy stuff is kind of a little bit all over there, but there is kind of a theme and we'll see that same theme of application and defenses, even in, uh, or, or rather flexibility, uh, better fitting. We'll see that in the modules as well. Now, in the frigates level, one, one of the things you'll notice is that each T2, T2 is the specialty stuff, okay? So T2 gain, often will gain an ability that other ships of that same type, or like other ships rather won't get. Like for instance, um, assault frigates and assault cruisers, heavy assault cruisers, they can use what's called the assault damage control, which is a specialty module that again, only they can use. So that becomes an advantage that those two ship classes get that no other ship class gets. Uh, Another good example is the recon, specifically the combat recon ship. Uh, There's two different recon ships for each empire. One of them can cloak, the other one cannot. Of the one that cannot, it actually cannot be seen by directional scanners at all. So you're your, your normal way of uh, seeing people in space by using directional scanners to see everybody around you, uh, this cannot be seen even if it's uncloaked, right? So these things are particularly dangerous in that sense. So as I said, each the, the Tech 2 stuff often has uh, advantages that are better than, or that are unique to any of the ship classes. However, they are much more focused on what they do. Um, so they, they cannot be... They, sometimes they even lose capabilities uh, versus their tech one uh, cap- uh, tech one version because they are specializing closer to what they really do. Okay, uh, and this is also where you see, in general, tech two has the higher skill requirement. Tech one has very low skill requirement. Tech two has usually pretty high skill requirement. This is in, true in ships and modules. Um, That's a big difference between the two. And then finally, there's Tech 3. Tech 3 is about uh, flexibility. I guess uh, while Tech 1 is about versatility, Tech 2 is about flexibility. So in the Tactical Destroyer case, you have a ship that can change its mode. So it goes from being uh, offensive-oriented to speed-oriented to defensive-oriented. It can, like, switch stances, as it were. Um, uh, But the you know so that way it can change to the to this the change of the battlefield as it were whereas uh strategic cruisers can completely change themselves they are consistent of various subsystems that can be swapped out and that changes everything about it its resources its abilities you know everything and it's also one of the it is the only ship class that you can remove rigs on which we'll talk a little bit about more later as well so as you can see, there's all different kinds of ships available. Usually for any given task, there'll be a, a pretty decent Tech 1 ship uh, that can get it done. And then usually some Tech 2 ships that will take it to the next level or even maybe even Tech 3 ships. Tech 3 ships generally can do almost any role um, at any given time. But uh, obviously not all of them at once, but they're incredibly powerful ships. But they are also spendy and and pretty high in skill requirements because they take six different skills to train 
uh, for each of the subsystems for each of the the Tech Three cruisers. On the industrial line, uh, and yeah, in the uh, hauling industrial line, you see kind of the same thing. There's a basic Tech One version of your haulers that are more general use, and then you have your Tech Two haulers, which have specialty abilities and specialty purposes. One of them cloaks. The other one uh, carries just a ton of space. And then, of course, you have your Tech 1 uh, big ol' freighter with Tech 2 freighter in the jump freighter. Uh, capitals are always Tech 1. So, there you have it. Although that doesn't mean, in this case, that they are low skill requirement. Um, they obviously require a huge amount of skill to step up to capitals. But they generally go with the general flexibility as opposed to being... Uh, you know, tech two-ified, as it were. So uh, that's how ships kind of lay out. So you would choose the, the kind of ship that goes in the direction and, and goes with the strengths that you are looking for. If you want to find out what the strengths of a ship is, there's two ways of, no of knowing. First of all, uh, there's you can hover over the ship and see what it's strong at, right? Like this Omen, it is a medium ship. It uses energy turrets. It is an attack ship. And it has armor defenses. Now, some of these symbols are unique to this ship in the line. And some of these symbols, as you can see, comes from here. The Amar Empire has very has specific specialties. All four empires do. Okay? So, two of the empires are focused on armor tanking. Which means they use armor as their primary defenses to keep themselves alive. Whereas the other two races, in general, use shield tanking. They use their shields uh, to protect themselves and have much more of their defenses in their shields than in their armor. In addition to that, each uh, race has a weapon system uh, and sometimes a secondary weapon system that they uh, utilize the Amar... Uh, sorry. And then also they have an Ewar or even a secondary Ewar system that they utilize. So the Amar and the Galente are the armor fit ones. Oh, also, of the four, one of them is usually based around more of a buffer style, and the other is more based around a resistance style. So in this case, the... Um, or to put it a different way, I like to think of it as one of the two fights interlocked because they're designed, their ships are designed to fight a little bit more as a fleet um, and have a lot more synergy as a fleet, whereas the other two are more skirmishy and independent. They can still fight as a fleet, but they function more independently of each other. Um, so the Amar is the Amar f uh, is the armor fleet one, right? So they're they have uh, they're designed to work together as a fleet. Uh, their logistics share capacitor within each other to keep themselves up. Uh, they have good resistances, etc. The Kaldari would be the shield fleet uh, version of, or, you know, the fleet version for the shields. The Galente would be the armor skirmishers. And the Mimitar would be the shield skirmishers. Okay? The Amar also focus on lasers. Now... We'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll jump onto that when we get to weapon systems. Each race has their own weapon system. Each race has their own E-War system. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, now, as you can see, so, so all of the MR ships are going to be focused either, or pretty much all of the MR ships are going to be focused on energy turrets or drones. There are a few others. There are a few that have missiles, but they're kind of outliers. Almost all Amar ships, I think all Amar ships focus on armor. Uh, if they do have E-War, it's usually going to be focused on energy destabilization, would be, which would be energy neutralizers or um, uh, energy Nosferatus, uh, and weapon disruption, either tracking disruption or missile disruption. So likewise, here we can see that this medium capability comes from the fact that this is a cruiser. All cruisers are mediums. That's a medium class ship. Um, and then likewise, there is an attack uh, den denotation. So at each tier, pretty much, um, there are different roles of ships, even in the T1 line, right? So the uh, Omen would be the attack version. The attack version means uh, a combat ship that is designed more for speed than for slugging, right? 
Meanwhile, <laughs> I got too close to something. Uh, meanwhile, the Mauler is a combat ship. Combat ships are designed more for brawling instead of speed. Okay. Um, the Augurer is your support ship. These guys are designed to repair and support their allies. And the Arbitrator is a disruption ship designed to do electronic warfare upon their enemy. Now, since we know that the Amar electronic warfare is weapon disruption and energy disruption, we can already guess that this disruption cruiser will be focused on one of those two, which lo and behold, there it is, the weapon disruption. You can look at the bonuses to see exactly what the ship is good at. Okay. So as we can see, there's one ship of each of those different roles here. And if we look back here, we can see the same thing in the frigate line. Now, these are all small because they're frigates, but we can see that this one is the disruption frigate. This one is the, this is a different one. We don't see this in the cruiser, uh, but this is the exploration frigate. This one is the fast one, so it's the attack frigate. This one is for, for logistics, for repping, so it's the uh, support frigate. The tormentor is the combat frigate. And actually, uh, I believe, yeah, Amara, or the frigates have two different combat frigates in this case. Um, likewise, we can see here that the coercer is the attack destroyer. Uh, actually, both destroyers are attack. I think that's true about all destroyers. Likewise... You have the combat cruiser, the uh, two combat cruisers, and an attack cruiser. The attack cruiser, or battle cruiser, rather. In the battle cruiser level, it's kind of interesting. The attack battle cruisers are able to fit one size category larger than them. So these are the glass cannons. Technically, destroyers and battle cruisers are glass cannons. They use the same, or they're, they're of the same tier as below them, but they bring more weapon systems to bear, but they aren't as agile. So, but in this case, this takes it to the extreme. This uses, this is a battle cruiser that uses battleship level weapons. Um, but because it's a battle cruiser, it's still pretty agile. Now, uh, battle cruiser comparatively. So these, this line of attack battle cruisers are really heavy hitting. Um, but if they can be hit are, are pretty much paper thin. So you don't see these a lot in, in PVE, for example, um, Whereas the Harbringer and the Prophecy are much more uh, sluggy, as it were. Likewise, you also see this in the uh, Battleship level. We see that this is a combat, so it's going to be more for slugging. This one is uh, a combat. This one is attack. Um, oh yeah, and the navies are, of course, the navies. Now, it's worth noting that while most of the navies are just a better version of of the previous thing with a little bit better ar uh, tank and a little bit better flexibility um, or, or tracking. There is actually one exception. Each of the logistics or uh, the, you know, the support cruisers, their Navy version are not support. They are brick tanked combat stuff, which means like they are just meaty, meaty, hard to kill stuff uh, that have good combat capabilities. It's a bit of a surprise for some people. I think that that probably, I mean, there's obviously, I could have an entire episode on just how each of the ships and all their little niches. We're not going to talk about all of them right now because we want to get to the actual fittings themselves. Um, destroyers are less agile than frigs, than attack battle cruisers are more agile than others. Correct. Uh, the, the attack battle cruisers are actually, well, attack are the most agile of that class. So the attack battle cruiser is are the are the agile version of the battle cruisers, if that makes sense. It just so happens that they also have the larger weapon system. So they are fast, less tanked battle cruisers with battleship weapons. Yep. Okay. So uh, also each sorry before we close up ships, um, each pirate ship has their own cheat, right? So a pirate ship while while. Uh, a normal empire ship will be impacted by their one empire racial skill. So like a Mar frigate will control how good you are at, at these frigates and how big these bonuses are. Uh, a Mar destroyer for these, a Mar cruiser for these. With the pirate ships, there's actually two different skills that go into each pirate ship, two different races. So in this case, the worm gets bonuses from Caldari and Galente. So they gain some, uh, Galente gives them some missile damage, 
whereas uh, bonus, whereas the Kaldari gives them some shield resistance bonuses. So they get two different uh, bonuses, which already makes them really strong. But then each pirate ship race also gets a cheat. So in this case, the uh, the Garistus cheat is that rather than using a full flight of drones as their major combat system, they actually use a far fewer. They only use two drones, but those drones are so strong, they're, they're actually stronger than most, uh, most guys' full flight of drones. So these guys become very, very deadly and extremely flexible in PvE. And we'll talk a little bit more about why drones and such make them flexible for that as we go on. Um, for now, we'll just accept that to be true. Sanchez Nation gets... Uh, some afterburner bonuses from their Kaldari side and the um, energy turret bonuses from their Amar side. And they also get a special bonus where... Oh, actually, sorry. Um, they get their roll bonus of energy uh, turret damage, which basically means that they get to do the same amount with less turrets. Uh, this gives them more potentially more utility highs and uh, use less crystals and all that sort of stuff. But also the big actually the big one here is actually in their Kaldari frigate bonus, their cheat. Their afterburners get so fast that they don't actually need to use micro warp drives. Micro warp drives have a tendency to uh, they move you quickly, but they don't make you harder to hit as much because they actually make you effectively bigger. We'll talk about that uh, as with everything else. We'll talk about that when we get there. Afterburners don't do that. So they get make you faster and harder to hit. Um, so these guys remain fast without making themselves easier to hit, which is kind of nice. Blood Raiders gain a web bonus from the Mimitar side and Nos and Newt bonuses from the Amar side. Their big cheat is while normally Nosferatus cannot drain from people who have a capacitor lower than theirs, uh, Blood Raiders can drain from the capacitor using a Nos, using uh, whatever, whatever their level is. And again, we'll talk about this more when we get there. Angel Cartel are just stupid fast. They get a bonus to their warp acceleration. Basically, I like to think of it as each goes one size category smaller. So like uh, a battleship moves like a medium, a medium moves like a frigate, and the frigate moves like an interceptor. They're just stupid fast. Um, Serpentis get the uh, hybrid bonus and the web bonus from their two races and uh, a bunch of extra damage. Their, bon their cheat is actually in this Mimitar frigate bonus, that stasis web of fire bonus. These guys, a stasis web is designed to slow down your opponent. These guys can slow them down to a freaking crawl. If they, if a, if a Serpentis ship gets to web you, uh, you, they're not moving very, or if you get your webs on somebody, they're not moving very fast if you're in a Sant or Serpentis ship. Sisters of Eve are a bit different. They are more explo exploration uh, focused, where the uh, Astero is, you know, all of them have, they're able to use covert ops cloaking devices as if they're covert ops. They have bonuses to their scanning and hacking skills. They're basically like super tech, or somewhere between tech one and tech two exploration frigates, um, which is kind of a, its own exploration. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that maybe another time more, but they are very combat capable given the fact that they are exploration frigates. Uh, people that underestimate them on, honestly uh, run into a lot of troubles. In particular, the Stratios is very deadly, but even the Astero can be very good. The Nestor is uh, battleship support, which makes it unique in the fact that it is the only dedicated support battleship. So that's pretty interesting. It's got really, really powerful armor reps. So repairing the, its allies' armor hit points. Mortis Legion have uh Kaldari and Galente skills. Kaldari giving them advance or sorry, Galente is their big cheat in the fact that they have extra long warp scram range. Warp scrams, as we'll talk about, are very powerful uh, to have in combat and the ability to be able to scram further than your opponent is incredibly strong in player versus player combat. Um and so this guy can kind of keep people at arm's reach while still having the missile velocities and such to be able to reach out and hit them uh, and do lots of damage. So these guys are really, really, really good at kiting their enemies or, or outrunning their enemies and, and pegging them from a distance. Uh, the Triglavian ships are a totally different beast. These are almost willing to, you know, you should consider them their own uh, race. They have their own weapon system, everything. 
We'll talk about them later. Same with Edencom. Edencom is a little bit less advanced than, T than Trig because the Trig have T2. They've been around for a couple of years longer. Uh, but uh, Edencom likewise have their own weapon system, uh, etc., etc., and should be considered just totally their own beast. Uh, all right. Now, let's jump into the fitting UI. So if you open up the fitting window, which uh, is over here on the Neocom, it opens up this screen. It'll show that you're actively fit window or ship or what ship you're currently in. And it'll show all these different things around the dial. There's this button up here with the word simulate underneath it. Uh, for some reason, my cursor isn't being shown. Let me double check to see if I can fix that. Capture cursor. There we go. Uh, over here, you can see the simulate box over and then off to the right, there's a whole bunch of stats. Off to the left is another gutter that has these three icons on it. It may not be there. It could be like this. In fact, it could even be like this. Chances are it's going to be like this or something like that when you first get to it um, or probably closer to this. Either way. Uh, and then over here in this area, you have uh, fitting and such. So let's go ahead and break this down step by step. First, we'll start on the left side. We have at the top. Uh, well, first of all, there's three different buttons. But this button is your skins. It shows you all of the skins for that ship, including uh, ones that you have, ones that you don't have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, not going to go into skins at the moment, outside of the scope. The browser is where we're going to spend a lot of our time. It, it allows you to br b uh, browse both ships, fitting, and hardware. Uh, on the there's two tabs at the top: holes and fits and hardware. Holes and fits lets you see all of the different ships and fits that you have. Uh, hardware lets you see all of ooh, lets you see all of the different uh, modules and equipment that can be fit onto ships with a bunch of different filters at the top. At the top of the holes and fits filter, we have uh, filter personal setting fittings. Let me bring it down a little bit. Personal fittings, corp fittings, community fittings, current hull, and skills. So personal fittings will filter it so that it's only things that you have saved for you. Corporation fittings are th say, uh, fittings that are saved for the corporation that you are in. Um, community fittings are for ships that you are... Uh, that it's Community fittings are ship fittings that have been approved by the community. So these are available to everyone. They are very basic ships. So if you're like, if you've been playing this game for more than a month, chances are you, these fits are not necessarily what you're going to need. But especially for a brand new player that are just getting into basic concepts, you have, you know, basic exploration frigates, you have basic abyssal uh, frigates and cruisers, you have uh, the SOE epic arc uh, destroyers, so you have some very basic fits for you to be able to use. They may continue to expand this out, um, but if you are a new player just trying to check things out, it might be worth checking out to see if there's a community fitting for something, especially if you're doing something relatively new. Um, this filter is for current hull. Basically, it makes it so that it only shows... Uh, well, that's kind of funny because it's simulating the current hull, but or the, my current hull is what it's simulating. But if I go here... My current hole is the Astero, so it'll only show me fits from the Astero. And then this fitting, or this filter, allow, it filters only ships that you can use, that you have the skills for, right? So that way you don't get uh, confused by ships that you're not allowed to use yet. Uh, it is being brought up a lot in chat, so I will go back and say that I did mention that the ship tree shows most of the ships. There is a special line of ships known as the Society of Conscious Thought ships, the uh, which is the Sinesis, the Gnosis, and the uh, Praxis, which is the Destroyer, the Battlecruiser, and Battleship, respectively. These are uh, specialty ships that are given away usually about once a year during the Eve anniversary um, that are ships that are very flexible. They, have, they can use any given weapon system. They have a, uh, a even slot layout. They have some uh, even so they have some exploration bonuses to them. 
Uh, and most importantly, they have zero skill requirements. The only requirement to them is Spaceship Command 1. So as a new player, especially if you're trying to jump into something uh, that's more advanced or like with your buddies that are doing like Battleship content, you, don't, you haven't trained all the way up the Battleship yet, or if you're using a buddy code and using a million SP and trying to get the most out of it, doing it with a Praxis or a Gnosis uh, can be very, very useful uh, for newer players. And, and for older players, Praxis, I mean, like, the Praxis is just generally a good battleship, especially along the T1 line. Um, okay, so you can see all the different kinds of ships that you have fits over here, or even not ship fits. So this is a just good good way to filter all the different ships by their categories. And then on this tab, this is all of the different modules in the game with, again, different filters. So they can be filtered for low slots, mid slots, high slots, rig slots, drones. This one here uh, filters only modules that can be fit onto your ship, like your ship has the capability of fitting them. This one um, filters out only things that you have the resources remaining to fit them, like on your particular ship that you're in or the simulation. And this one is, of course, uh, which ones that you have skills for. And then underneath that, you'll actually have two sub-menus where you have the modules. These are the different sh uh, things that get fit to your ship. And then charges, which are like ammunition that goes inside of individual modules. So that's how this gutter breaks down. This third tab here is inventory. So it's basically the same thing as this one, but it allows you to look at only the things that are in your ship hold or in your item hanger and look at it that way. Um, this shows everything here. And it doesn't care whether or not you own it or not. So, uh, I'm actually going to hit simulate to get a advantage or to, to kind of show what this does. So, you can either be looking at your main ship. This is my real ship as it really is. As you can see, none of my modules are turned on. So, all the stats here will just be as it is with none, nothing turned on, whatever. If I hit simulate... Now I'm able to see what the ship is like, both by changing the fitting however I want to, and by making changes, right? So I can see that my speed is actually 2879 meters per second. Let me move this. 2879 meters per second with my micro warp drive on. But if I turn it off, I see my speed is only 388. Whereas if I go to my real time, it says, oh, 388, why? because my micro warp drive isn't on in reality, and therefore my reality speed is 388. If I simulate, I can simulate what it's like if it's on. Therefore, it says 2879. Likewise, I can actually remove this completely from the fit, and it modifies this fit. I can save it, I can fit it, you know, whatever. But if I exit the simulation, it obviously makes no difference to my actual fit, right? So simulate allows us to experiment. It allows us to try out ship fits that you uh, may not necessarily have. Also, if you make a change to your ship, now I won't be able to do it right here because I'm undocked, but like if you had an open slot and you dragged and dropped something from here to fill it that you don't actually have, it won't, or even if you actually have it, it won't uh, fit it. It'll enter into simulation mode with that now fit. Uh, because it doesn't just try to do it automatically from from this window. Now, one of the other things to note about this window is that you, if you are going to drag things off, you can't drag it off outside of here. If you want to drag it off, you have to drag it back into this gutter where it came from. You can right-click to unfit a module. All right. Now then, let's go ahead and break down this, this dial around here. So your ship fitting is broken down into different resources, okay? You have different resources available to you. You have uh, power grid, deep, sorry, power grid, CPU, high slots, mid slots, low slots, and rig slots, okay? So let's first start with power grid and CPU. Power grid represents how much power is in your overall system. Um, High-powered things will require more power. Low-powered things will usually require less power grid. You can see how much power grid and CPU everything, any, any given thing takes by going into its show info and going to its fitting requirements. You can see like this thing has 21 teraflops of CPU usage, 
14 megawatts of power grid usage. If you put on something and do not have enough power grid for it, something will not turn on. It just simply will not turn on at all. So you must have enough power grid and enough CPU for your entire fitting. If you do not, then it'll do this. Let's, let's grab something that's too big for this ship. If I take this gigantic afterburner, and I cannot, I can't even fit that one. Um, if I take this afterburner and put it on here, you'll see that now my power grid is over. It's over by 666 uh, units, coincidentally enough. Um, and you can see that this bar is flashing. I can hover over the bar to see how far above I am. So at this point, I am actually 1700% over my fitting requirement, which I, I think I'm going to have a bit of a difficulty making up that difference. So chances are I'm going to not be able to fit this particular module on this particular ship, right? Uh, yeah. So we're going to take this back off and we can see, oh, now I've got plenty of power grid. I've only used 45%. This is useful because sometimes you may need to know how much percentage over you are. If you're within like two or 3%, you can actually use what's called an implant to get, make that difference. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Okay. So same with CPU, CPU, but unlike CPU, there is no, uh, there isn't quite as much of a rhyme and reason as to like, which things take more CPU, which things take less CPU. We'll look at that as we look at the individual modules, but, uh, in the same sort of way as you have power grid, you have CPU. If you have too much, uh, something that takes too much CPU, It'll blow it out. It'll flash in the same way. You can hover over it. It's basically identical in mechanics as power grid. Uh, just different things to cost it and different things um, uh, give you CPU. Now, on top of that, you have high slots, mid slots, and low slots. Now, why are these called this? In general, high slots take up a lot of power grid and or a lot of uh, capacitor to use. Mid slots take a moderate amount of capacitor and or power grid. And low slots in general take less power grid and or uh, capacitor. Okay. So, uh, and likewise, we can actually hover over individual modules on our fit and we can see how much they consume, right? So we can see here, like the, uh, hopefully you can see that the green bar lights up a fair chunk. That's, a, that's quite a bit of CPU being consumed, but almost none of the uh, red bar lights up. Whereas if I move over here to the, well, actually these are very low powered, low slot or high, uh, high slot items. This afterburner takes up over half of my power grid, right? So, um, yeah. So each module is connected to a type of slot, right? So it's not like you can fit a high-powered module into a low-powered pow slot. Let's let's grab a thorax just for just to have something to show. If I look at this thorax, which is a, a Galente cruiser, I can see I have quite a bit of high slots. I have quite a bit of mid slots. And I have, well, a few mid slots and a few low slots. I have one, two, three, four, five high slots, one, two, three, four mid slots, and one, two, three, four, five low slots. Um, also, sorry, there's one other piece, a uh, uh, resource, which is hard points. Okay. In this case, you have turret hard points. You have five turret hard points. That's what these circles mean. Okay. If I went with a caracal, Very similar slot layout, although five mid slots, four low slots. Um, but in this case, instead of having uh, turret hard points, it doesn't have any turret hard points. Instead, it has five launcher hard points. Turret hard points allows you to fit turrets. Launcher hard points allows you to hit fit uh, missile launchers. Cool. So you so one of the things that you'll notice is like. Um, If we look at the Hurricane, which is a Mimitar battle cruiser, we'll see that it has four. Or it has six turret hardpoints, 
and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven actual high slot hard point or actual hide slots, which means it has one more high slot than it has turrets. Now you could put a launcher into this position because it does have launcher hard points too. Um, however, having only one launcher isn't going to make that much of a difference. Uh, some people do that. Some people don't. Now, there are also ships that don't have a launcher hardpoint, but do have that final slot that can't be, or maybe even multiple slots. A good example is those Sancha ships, probably, or I believe. But um, this is what's known as a utility high slot, okay? So, in general, high slots, not in general, high slots are either a combat slot, which means it'll be a weapon system, either a turret or a missile launcher, or it'll be a utility high slot. So let's go look at what, what high slots can be. We're going to filter by high slots and see what we can have. So the first things first, we're going to look at turret and launchers, which are the biggest ones. We have energy turrets, hybrid turrets, and projectile turrets. We also have precursor turrets, which are the special Triglavian ones. Energy turrets are the focus of Amar ships. They're lasers. Hybrid turrets are the focus of both the Caldari and the Galente, showing off their, uh, you know, uh, similar origin or, you know, combined origin. Um, and projectile turrets are focused, are the focus of Mimitar ships. Now, energy turrets are high powered. They take a lot of capacitor to use. Um, but in general, shoot with a very far optimal range, but a very short fall off. Projectiles are exactly the opposite. They take zero capacitor, have a very short optimal range, and a very long fall off. And rail guns are somewhere in between. They take a moderate amount of capacitor. They shoot, um, they shoot, well, Depending on which one it is, they either shoot extremely short or extremely far. Um, and yeah, also with the weapon systems, the energy turrets and hybrid turrets are damage locked. They all energy turrets and hybrid turrets do the same damage. Energy turrets, every single one does EM and thermal. Every hybrid does uh, kinetic and thermal. Right? Hold on, let me double check that real quick. Yep, kinetic and thermal. Okay, so what did I, I just kind of jumped ahead a little bit? So let's uh, let's rein it back in. Um, so each of the races uh, energy turrets, or sorry, each of the uh, races weapons. Let's go ahead and look at the uh, or sorry, each of the weapon systems turrets and launchers. On each, it has two different varieties on each tier, right? Uh, one will be a short range, and one will be a long range. So there's the short range small weapon, the long range small weapon, the short range uh, medium, long range medium. Now, uh, they all have different names often, but they are what they are. Um, so you have... For energy turrets, you have the beam lasers, which are your long-range weapons, and the pulse lasers that are the short-range weapons. For hybrid turrets, you have blasters that are your short-range weapons, and rail guns that are your long-range uh, weapons. For projectiles, you have autocannons that are short-range, and artillery that is long. Missiles have different names for everything. Um, but in this case, we have rockets for short range uh, and light missiles for long range uh, small weapons. We have heavy or we, heavy assault launchers for uh, short range and heavy launchers for medium. And we have torpedoes and cruisers for long range. Um, now each weapon system also uses ammunition, which changes how that weapon functions. And each weapon system has their own uh, kind of relationship to that. It, energy and hybrid turrets are, uh, given the fact that they are damage locked, most of their focus is on range versus damage, right? So in this case, the Amar weapon systems 
I can just pull up any of them. If you if you right click and show info on a weapon system or really any module, you can show up there show info. And if they get used with a charge, you can go to the used with page and it'll say all the different stuff that it uses, right? So these are all the different kinds of ammunition that you can use in a tech two uh, laser. As you can see, there's a bunch of different crystals. The way that this works is that the crystals are um, organized, not in this order, actually, this is alphabetical, but the actual order of range is in um, RGB format, right? So radio, infrared, microwave, these are the longest range ones. Standard is somewhere in between with uh, gamma, x-ray, ultraviolet in, as the short ranger with multi-frequency being the shortest range, highest damage crystal, right? So we can actually see this in motion by uh, opening up the compare tool. You open up the compare tool by right-clicking any item and hitting compare, or by going to the variations tab of any given item and hitting the compare button, which will add all of the different of that version of the item. But in this case, we'll, and then we can grab all of these and drag them in, and we'll see. At the top left of the compare tool, you'll have a gear. You'll want to make sure that the check mark only show attributes that differ it appears. And we can see real quick that there you go. Blue, green, purple, yellow, uh, red, orange, uh, or infrared microwave radio, right? So roughly RGB. Uh, yeah, RGB. Either way. Um with multi-frequency is the closest range. And you'll also see that their damage ramps up too, right? But it's all EM and thermal either way. There is a bit different of difference in the ratios though, where this is like half and half, whereas this is, you know, seven EM and five thermal. This is no thermal damage, 100% EM. So there is some variations there, but that's a, that's a lot of nuance that you probably don't need to worry about right now. Likewise, the hybrid weapons... are arranged, uh, are not arranged, but as you can see, they have the highest damage is antimatter with the low, with the lowest damage of iron, but iron increases your range bonus by 60% where, um, antimatter is by, uh, re reduces your range by 50%, cuts your range in half. Um, oh, there's another piece I met, forgot which is both crystals and railguns because they take, or lasers and railgun, or sorry, both energy weapons and hybrid weapons, since they both take capacitor, the weapon, the ammunition that they use also consumes more capacitor, uh, or more or less capacitor, depending on what kind they are. So um, you can see right here that the... Iron charge takes 30% reduced capacitor usage, but the mid-range lead takes the lowest capacitor usage. Likewise, we can actually see the same thing in lasers. Where the lowest, sorry, the, yeah, the lowest range has the, the highest capacitor consumption, the and the biggest bonus to your capacitor consumption, the biggest reduction in capacitor need, and therefore the less capacitor used, is the mid range. So your standard is going to be your lowest capacitor usage as a laser, and likewise the mid tier one, um, or the mid range one, I should say, of the Galente. is also so the lead. Right? Just a little difference there. Now, there is another difference between the two, which is that uh, lasers um, get used... Sorry, lasers will reload instantly. Right? So as long as your ship is not firing actively, you know, you just have to turn off your weapon system and swap out your ammo. Um, whereas... 
think it's here. Do they have it here? Yeah, reload time. Whereas a railgun can be upward, you know, five seconds or so of reload. So while they both swap damage or swap what ammo they use uh, based on what range they're attacking at, it is far quicker for Amar ships to react to range changes than for Mimitar or for, for Glente or Kaldari ships if they're using railguns. Uh, projectiles are even worse in that sense. So, but rails and, 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 um, and energy turrets are pretty similar in those regards. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's been pointed out to me that I forgot to mention damage. I'm talking about damage types, so let's talk a little bit about what those mean. In EVE, there are four different damage types. There's no such thing as Omni Damage. There's no such thing as True Damage. There's no such thing as Chaos Damage. Everything must be one of these four damage types. And those four damage types can be resisted. They are Electromagnetic, Thermal, Kinetic, and Explosive. So the way it works is that your damage, the damage comes in. Your resistance reduces the damage by the amount of your resistance to that damage type. And then you take the rest of the damage. Okay, so the the fact that Amar ships and Mimitar ships, sorry, Amar ships and Galen, uh, sorry, energy weapons and hybrid weapons are damage locked is a hindrance because then your opponent knows what kinds of damage types you're going to use if you're using those weapon systems and therefore what to defend against. Whereas if you are in uh, missiles and um, it, it, sorry, it missiles or turret, uh, projectile turrets, they can actually change what damage type they're doing, so it, they're far less predictable. Damage differences between ammo that uses most cap and least cap? You mean the fact that they do more or less damage? Um, yeah, projectiles and launchers are 10 seconds. Rapid launchers are... 35 seconds hybrids are five seconds and energies are zero seconds we'll talk a little bit about rapid uh in a little bit when we're done with turrets so that covers a lot of the energy turrets and hybrid turrets um now let's talk about projectile turrets projectile turrets are basically the exact opposite of energy tur wait one more thing i got to talk about when it comes to these so Actually, well, this, this is kind of the same thing. So we're going to choose, in each tier of things, there are multiple size categories within each size category, right? I, that's really confusing. So let me, let me show you what I mean. As far as small laser uh, energy weapons go, there are actually three different kinds, okay? There is dual light pulse, Gatling Pulse, and uh, Small Focus, right? No. Yeah, Small Focus Pulse. Now, some of them only have two types. We'll talk, you know, whatever. But most of them have three. And they're usually... The, the difference between them is that the, they, they are arranged from, like... Yeah, subsize, uh, subcategory. Subsize. I, I don't know, whatever. Um, in general, there's a lighter weight... There's lighter weight ones and there's heavier weight ones. The heavier weight ones consume more resources, hit harder, and shoot further. And uh, yeah, whereas the lighter ones track better, do less damage, but take less fitting. So we can see that the um, if we arrange by even if we arrange by optimal range, we'll see that the small focus pulse laser is on top with the Gatling laser on bottom. And if we look at the other details like damage modifiers, we'll see that that matches. The highest damage modifier goes to the bigger weapon. But likewise, we can also see that the CPU and power grid requirement for these are also higher. The small focus pulse laser takes twice as much power grid and over three times as much CPU as a Gatling pulse laser. So you may want to fit the biggest, strongest weapon that you can for your size category, but depending on what your resources are, you may have to step down to one of the lighter ones. Likewise, if you're trying to hit something smaller than you, the lighter weight stuff often has better tracking. Tracking is uh, what determines how well the projectile can keep track of an enemy that's moving quickly. 
So this Gatling pulse laser, while it doesn't shoot as far and it doesn't hit as hard, it takes less stuff and it can hit things better than, uh, or like it can with more precision than the bigger laser. Okay. Uh, this is true pretty much up and down the size categories. And then likewise, there is a focus per weapon system. So we're going to go with, this is the heaviest of the uh, laser, short lasers. We're going to look at the, the short of the projectiles and the hybrids too, to see what we can learn from this. Likewise, we're going to bring in all three of the hybrid basic weapon systems. See which one is the highest there? It's this one. Remove the other two, because we want to just compare the, the highest ones with each other. Uh, and then likewise, for the lasers, or sorry, for the projectiles, my bad, we have, it's kind of obvious with uh, projectiles, because it's like the bigger one is the biggest one. So let's look at this. As far as CPU usage goes, the laser takes the most. As far, uh, no, my bad. As far as CPU usage goes, the blaster takes the most. As far as power grid goes, the laser takes the most. As far as the damage goes, the blaster gets the most. And as far as the optimal range goes, the laser gets the most. But as far as fall off, the auto cannon gets the most. All right, so let's talk about what that means. Um, the optimal range is the range in which you have a 100% chance of hitting a stationary large object. It is your chance to 100% 100 uh, 100 hit the broadside of a barn. Your fall off is the distance past your optimal by which you now hit 50% of the time when you shoot at the broadside of a barn, okay? So in other words, with a laser, I will hit accurately up to 5,000, sorry, up to five kilometers, and then we'll hit reasonably accurately for another two and a half kilometers. Likewise, with an autocannon, I will shoot effectively at a thousand meters, or one, uh, one kilometer, but I have a fall off of five kilometers. So technically speaking, the, per, the, the projectile ammo does have a shorter total range, right? Because they both, like, uh, the laser gets to seven... Uh, over 7.5k whereas the mimitar or the projectile only gets 6k the hybrid actually is the shortest in its 1.5 and 2.5 respectively for a total of four four kilometers before blasters start uh falling off or sorry before blasters like basically lose effectiveness so in general Lasers have a higher optimal range, so they can hit accurately further. They can, we say, project further. They have higher damage at range. Um, auto cannons have. They, I like to say that auto cannons are always within range. They, their fall off is very long, which and they also have a lot of bonuses to that fall off. So they keep a lot of their enemies in their fall off, but they're somewhere in fall off. Right. So they're almost never hitting at 100 percent accuracy, but the closer that they are, the better they get. Right. So whereas the lasers are good, 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 bad. It's like good, good, good. OK, OK, meh, bad. Right. Um, and actually, because they're shooting off into their fall off, it leads into another piece of the puzzle, which is the fact that their tracking is better than lasers, which means that. While they can't project as far, they can track faster. 
Now, this is all short range weapon system. We'll talk about long range weapon systems next. Or like in a, 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 separately. Um, so blasters, just to help you understand blasters and how they work uh, in relationship to this, blasters are the shotguns of Eve. They do insanely high damage with insanely good tracking for two feet. And then it falls apart, right? So blasters are shotguns. And then lasers and uh, projectiles are basically the counter to each other. Lasers are inflexible damage, good projection, fast reload, they, you know, flexible at ranges. Mimitars are uh, able to select their damage better, do not require any capacitor, therefore can continue to fire when, ca when, when having no capacitor. Uh, however will almost never be shooting at 100% efficiency. All right? And then blasters are, I want to get really close to you and tell you how much I love you. Now, let's talk about long-range weapons, since it was brought up. The long-range laser system is known as pulse lasers. Sorry, beam lasers. Likewise, we're going to find the best one of each of these. One of the ways that you can tell the base model is looking for the T2 one. There's a lot of other names. So to cut through the chaff, I like to just go to the T2 then go to the variation and then see like, oh gosh, it's even there. Um, but yeah, dual light beam laser and small focus beam laser. Of the two, we can look which one's got the longest range. This one does remove that one. Let's go to hybrids. Their long range is known as rail guns. We can go for the biggest number. Kind of handy. And uh, artillery for projectiles. And once again, we can just go for the biggest number. All right. So once again, we look at the rate of fire, the damage modifier, optimal range, Tracking, power grid, CPU, sure. So, let's look at these and see what we get out of this. When it comes to the furthest range, we have railguns. Railguns, then lasers, then projectiles. When it comes to the damage, damage modifiers, we have projectiles on top. That's, that's worth noting. What's going on? Why didn't why did that get killed? All right. Um projectiles have really 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 high damage modifier. The rate of fire, however, the artillery fires twice as slow as any of the other two. Any of the other two. It's the shortest of them all. It's It fires half as often, but it has this giant damage bonus. Likewise, it has very low tracking compared to the laser that has the highest tracking and pretty good optimal. Where's fall off? Did we get fall off? As far as fall off goes, you have the uh, laser has decent fall off, railgun has better fall off, how howitzer actually has low fall off. So that's really interesting. This kind of breaks the model that we saw earlier, right? Um, uh, sorry, optimal range rather. Accuracy fall off is here. So we see short optimal. No, no, no. It, it follows the. It follows it. I'm stupid. So yeah, longest optimal is the railgun, then artillery. Well, it doesn't actually quite match it, because it, this time, rather than the... Hold on. Railgun. This time, rather than uh, the hybrid weapon being the shortest, it's the furthest. That's why I was saying, like, railguns either, or hybrids either shoot really, really short, or really, really far. Okay? Whereas the 
um, the lasers and the projectiles kind of reverse each other, right? So this, the laser has, once again, a higher optimal range than the projectile, but the projectile has a higher fall off. This difference isn't nearly as big, but it does favor a little bit the artillery, which is kind of interesting. Now, the laser, though, has a much higher tracking. Now, these are much lower than the short range ones, but remember, we're shooting something way further away. I missed the sizes. I don't know what you mean. Uh, yes, lasers track better than rail guns. Um, so let's talk about what this means when it comes to the three of them. It, 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 it breaks down to a really simple rule. Hybrids shoot, uh, when it comes to uh, long range weapons, rail guns shoot the furthest. Lasers shoot, project the most accurately. And artillery are what's called the highest alpha damage. When we consider damage, there are two different considerations. There is standard DPS, which is how much damage you will do over time. But then there's alpha damage, which is when you hit the weapon, how much damage is done at once. And that is where artillery comes in. That's why it has this really slow rate of fire. That's why it has this really high damage modifier. The Because if you think about it, if both weapon systems have the same DPS, then the weapon system with half the rate of fire must also do twice the damage per hit. And if when you hit them, your opponent explodes, it does not matter how long it takes for you to take your second shot. This is why artillery often gets used for ganking in high sec because they bring the most upfront damage to be able to kill somebody before they can react. Whereas if they are trying to kill something through raw damage, you will see them bring the blasters, the hybrid weapons, because those bring the most DPS and they can ensure that they're really close in order to get the most damage out of your blasters. This is why you often see catalysts and thrashers and tornadoes as your major suicide gankers. Catalysts for high DPS, uh, you know, the maximizing your DPS within the 20 seconds or whatever that you get before Concord shows up. Tornadoes to delete something before it can even get its, you know, hardeners on, right? So, meanwhile, rail guns have ridiculous range, especially given the fact that a lot of the ships that specialize in uh, hybrids, mostly the Caldari ships, uh, sorry, in rail guns, uh, mostly the Caldari ships have bonuses to the range of the rail guns. So while they have relatively low tracking, they're going to hit something so freaking far away that it won't matter because like it's so far away. It's basically not moving according to the to it. So you're seeing sniper corms and sniper feroxes being able to uh, put out huge amounts of damage at range. Lasers are able to project at range with accuracy. So um, a lot of again, you will still see a lot of snipers go with that. If they don't need the extreme range of the rail guns, you'll see often uh, lasers get used for sniping comps because they'll actually be able to hit things at that range. Uh, yes, Hakates are a good uh, weapons platform for blasters as well, but not necessarily used for suicide ganking because they're um, they're a bit more spendy than them catalysts. OK, so. That kind of explains the turrets and uh, the different kinds of turrets for the different kinds of uh, sizes or for the different uh, for both short range and long range. Let's apply that to them to the other weapon systems now. First. Actually, we'll go with the other with uh, we'll, we'll 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 jump over to, to precursor weapons. 
Precursor weapons are a little bit different. These are advanced weapon systems. If you're brand new, these are ships that you need to be uh, a paid account in order to train into. They're a bit more advanced. So we're actually going to skip kind of past over these a little bit, but we do want to talk about what makes these things special. Um, in the same way, we're going to compare this to uh, a, just an energy weapon, right? So we have a dual... Did we decide that it was dual a focal light master? I can't remember now. Oh no, these are beams. Pulse. Small focus pulse later. That's what it was. Small focus pulse later versus light entropic disintegrator. Uh the optimal range. So a light entropic disintegrator is going to shoot a little bit further than even a small pulse. So I probably along the same lines as a rail gun. Let's go double check that. Or not a rail gun, but a blast. No, not a blaster because those don't shoot very far. Uh, no, yeah, because this is the highest optimal. So the entropic disintegrator has the furthest optimal of its class. But. Where's fall off? There it is. Accuracy fall off. You can see that the lasers have 2,500, uh, 2.5 meter or kilometers fall off, while the entropic disintegrator has zero. This is the biggest, uh, this is the first special thing about entropic disintegrators, which is that entropic disintegrators, if they get past their optimal, they shut off. They do not fire past their optimal. Okay. However, they shoot pretty far. And remember, lasers were super accurate, right? Look at that. 410 tracking. Hell, let's go look at blasters. A bla so this entropic disintegrator has better tracking than the heaviest bla than the heavy blaster of its level and a significantly higher optimal range. So it's able to project like a laser but track like a blaster that is strong okay but if you go past that optimal it shuts off completely why does that matter because of the other piece that makes the disintegrator unique which is that each time it cycles its damage multiplier increases so in this case each time that the laser entropic disintegrator cycles it gains five percent of its total multiplier bonus so you can see here, uh, the light neutron blaster starts with, uh, or ha you know, they have these damage modifiers, right? This thing can cycle; it gets five percent additional d damage per cycle, up to one hundred and fifty percent DP or damage. So while this thing starts at one, it can go up to one point two five, and uh, it it also depends on the ammo how much damage it does. So these entropic disintegrators, if they're allowed to what's called ramp up, then it will do way more damage than their counterparts. They start out a little bit lower, but they can ramp up way higher. Plus, they have that high tracking at far range. But again, if they're optimal, if they go past their optimal, it shuts off and they have to start all over at the beginning of their cycle. All right, next is missile systems. Missile systems work very, very differently than all of the turrets. Um, actually, before we, we, before we begin uh, that, I want to explain just a little bit about how turrets do damage. You can imagine that there is a... Uh, that basically every time a turret shoots, they roll a percentile die. So it generates a random number between 1 and 100, okay? Now, if that number, if 100 minus that number is lower than your percent chance to miss, you do. So what that means is, if you have a 4% chance to miss and you roll a 98, you miss. If you roll a 95, you hit with a 95, which means 
your percentage chance of missing is not only making you miss, but it's making you lose your best hits, except for crits, which we'll get to in a second. Then that number, assuming that you hit, uh, is added to 50, and that's how much percent damage of your turret damage that you do. So if you hit, you can do anywhere from 51% to 150% of your turret's total or actual damage. All right. So turrets can miss, and they have a random amount of damage based on what you roll. Now, if you roll a 1, then that is considered a crit. In EVE, we call this a wrecking shot. What that means is, you can almost always get a wrecking shot. If you have any chance at all to hit, if you have 1% chance to hit, if you've, if you've had your chance to hit reduced by 99%, you still have 1% chance to hit, and if that 1% hits, it will be a crit. And if it is a crit, then it does uh, 300% damage. Okay? I have not actually, uh, I have not talked about that. I, I'll get, I'll circle back on that in a second. Um, yeah, if you have, if you have 0.00001% chance, then you have that much chance of critting. Now, if you've, for some reason, reduced your chance to, you know, 99.5 and you roll a 1, then guess what? It's still a, a miss because you're in the miss range. But um, the crit, like... If you're below one, or if you're at one, and you have at least a one percent chance to hit, you will, or that one will be a crit, and it'll do three hundred percent. Now, what? How is that different than launchers? Launchers are very, very different from that. Whereas turrets are a random number generation, missiles are a math formula. Okay, so let's explore what that means. First and foremost, like I said, there is a short range and a long range weapon system for each size category. In in missile systems, they're called guided and unguided missiles, but I can't think of a practical reason why that matters at the moment. So let's go ahead and look at, um, for example, our short range weapon systems, rockets. Or uh, sorry, our small weapon systems. So you have rocket launcher and light missile launcher. Now, one thing you'll notice is we haven't really talked about the other named ones, but one thing you'll notice is that each category only has one type. We don't have like the laser, the turrets had three different types, two to three types per size category. This only has one. There's just, there's just miss light missile launchers and rocket launchers. That's, that's interesting by itself. The other thing that's worth noting is there is no, optimal range or anything like that here on these either there's no optimal range there's no fall off there's no no range information whatsoever there's also no damage information whatsoever uh well actually that was true about the turrets too so but the, where that all comes from is from the ammunition itself because see a turret shoots its ammo right like it it shoots the bullet and the bullet goes and hits a missile more or less shoots itself, right? It has it has an engine behind it, it has a rocket of some kind, and projects itself into the thing. So it's the missile that matters, whereas with a projectile, it's the gun that matters. So let's look at the missiles. In a light missile launcher, you're going to have these different kinds of missiles. Now, where before we saw a bunch of types of crystals and hybrid ammo that uh, de de denoted range, I messed up with projectiles. We'll, we'll circle back with projectiles on this one, too. Um, these are based on damage type. So, effectively, all four of these missiles are sort of the same in, in almost every way. Uh, let's, let's do this. Reset all. Sort of the same, but what you'll notice is 83 damage, 83 damage, 83 damage, 83 damage. So they are all basically identical, except how much damage, what damage type they do. 
This is true across all of the missile systems. All missiles of the same category, like the same like pref or uh, you know type, have the same statistics except for the damage type. Um, so all faction missiles are, or all faction missiles of a specific faction type are the same. All all skirt. Um, all rage missiles are the do the same, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they just are determined by damage type. And the damage type can be denoted by the name. Scourge means kinetic, Novo Neat means explosive, Molnir Neat means EM, Inferno means thermal. You can tell also by the tip. It doesn't matter which weapon system it is, as long as it's a missile, the tip of the missile will denote its damage type. Uh, Scourge for green. Nova for yellow, Molnir for blue, Inferno for red. Okay. Um, so in general, the missiles like the there are different kinds of missiles that have different purposes, but within those, there's those four types of missiles for each of the damage types, and that's kind of how it's denoted. And again, there's only one launcher of each kind. Um and the short range and long range of each one. So you have light missiles and you have uh, rockets. If I may skip back for just a second, in the same way, if we go to projectile turrets and we look at their ammunition, that's definitely not a good example. So while Amar and Galente were very, very simple, they do switching out your ammo changes your range versus damage. Um, and missiles do uh, switching out the missiles determines a change of damage without effectiveness. Projectile ammo is a hodgepodge of the two. OK, so not only is there a track, a, a range bonus on these different ranges for different things, we have them arranged from from bottom to top. But they actually determine which damage types they do, right? So an EM round will do nine EM damage, one explosive, one kinetic. A fusion round will do 10 explosive, 10, uh, two kinetic. A phase plasma will do 10 damage, 10 thermal, 10 kinetic. So all three of these ammo types, EMP, fusion, and phase to plasma, are the short range damage, right? But this one has EM, uh, this one does more EM, this one does more explosive, this one does more thermal. Likewise, these two are uh, the middle range ones, with this one being high uh, kinetic, and this one being more flat with less NEM. And then these three are the longer range ones with the top one having most of its damage in kinetic, this one, uh, the nuclear having most of its damage in uh, explosive, and proton having most of its damage in EM. It's being pointed out in the chat uh, that there is tracking speed bonuses changes, and this is true across all of the ammo, but uh, that mostly comes up in T2. So, uh, but it is true, especially in projectile ammo, they do have uh, some fluctuation in its tracking speed multipliers just to make uh, certain things track better than others. When it comes to T2, generally T2 ammo uh, has worse applications, but I, we'll, I think we'll talk about that when we get there. Let's hop back to launchers. Now, uh, the thing about each launcher is that there's actually, I, I kind of lied earlier, there's not two different uh, kinds of launchers. There are three kinds of launchers. The first kind of launcher, uh, or we, we talked about the short range and the long range, but for all size categories except for small, there is a third kind of launcher, which is a l rapid launcher. So, actually to explain that, we kind of need to explain how missiles are different than than projectiles. So let's go ahead and look at one of these missiles.
Oops, I got rid of the compare tool. Uh, okay, so we got explosion velocity, we've got explosion radius, we got maximum flight time, we've got maximum velocity, and then we've got the damage, right? We've already looked at damage, that's fine. So what are all these stats? You have explosion velocity, explosion radius, maximum flight time, maximum velocity. So these two stats, explosion velocity and explosion radius, go together, and these two stats, maximum flight time and maximum velocity, go together. So we're going to talk about them in reverse order. When a missile leaves the tube, the first two stats to apply are these two, maximum flight time and maximum velocity. Now, it does take a few, like, it does take, like, a fraction of a second for it to get up to speed. So it's not always going its maximum velocity, but you can kind of assume that it is. And the maximum flight time is how long it goes um, before it goes, you know, before it, it can no longer go. It becomes ineffective. So, in general, you can multiply this number by this number in order to get its maximum flight distance. Now, it'll be a little bit lower than that because, like I said, it gets up to speed. And there is a bit of a caveat where because of the one second tick of the game, um, if it's not a full second of uh, flight time, it does some wonkiness with the math to try to make it all work. So it's not literally true, but... For the most part, we can just consider it that way, right? Maximum flight time times maximum velocity equals maximum distance that I can hit things with a, with a missile. Where with a turret, you had optimal range and fall off that determined how well you hit it. With a missile, either the missile makes it to the ship or it doesn't. And if it does, then that's where the other two numbers come in play. You have the explosion velocity and the explosion radius. The explosion velocity uh, is the uh, the explosion velocity is how fast the explosion happens, and the explosion radius is how big the the explosion is. Now I have a lot of notes on here, but we're going to uh, is this going to work? We're going to try it. So the way I like to think about it is, let's say we have a level, right? Now in this level, we have a we have a bubble inside, right? So so the outside of the level has this circle that lets you see where it's level. If it's in the center, you know, like a level like for uh, for like draft uh, not drafting but like construction or whatever, right? So you have the air bubble in the middle that like if it tilts to the left, then that means it's not center or right. It goes to not center. But in this case, the bubble is in the center and it's not as big as the framing, right? So in this case, the framing is the explosion radius, and how far from the center is the explosion velocity. So what happens is that the explosion velocity is compared to your velocity, or sorry, your target's velocity, the, the thing that's hit by the missile, and the explosion radius is compared to the, to the target's signature radius. Now, signature radius is a concept that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, it does apply to turrets, too. But what signature radius is, is basically how big you are according to the simulation, right? Now, your ship's model is only a certain size, um, but your signature radius is how effectively big you are. So the way it works is, is that the, the faster you are going, the more that the, the, if you are going faster than the explosion velocity, you take less damage. And if you're smaller than the explosion radius, you take more damage. So to, to use this diagram as an example, basically, uh, the more of the outer bubble that is covered, the more damage this is going to do. So in this case, since it's in the center, its explosion velocity is as high, if not higher, than the target's velocity. But its explosion radius appears about twice as big as the target's explosion uh, radius, or as the target's um, uh, signature radius. And therefore, the, the inner bubble covers about half of the outer bubble, which means 
it is uh, going to take about half the damage. Okay? Likewise, if we have another level... Now this, this bottom one has a much larger signature radius than the, uh, than the explosion radius, but it's also going faster than the velocity, moving it out from the center, okay? Now, that large explosion, or that large signature radius makes it so that a lot of it is still in the inner circle. All of this explosion, all of this extra radius that's outside of the, the circle, all that doesn't count because that's what you moved out of the circle with your speed. So only the start that's inside of the bubble, the outer bubble, is, is allowed to count. So that bigger signature radius is getting you to take more damage, but your speed is countering it as well. So this sliver is taken out. You're going to take about 80% of the damage or 70% you know, of the damage instead of 100% of the damage. What this means in practice is that if you know your opponent's explosion uh, uh, or your, your, expo your opponent's velocity and your, explo your opponent's signature radius, you could actually do the math to determine exactly how much damage your missiles are going to do to your target every single time. Whereas with a turret, all you can do is determine your chance of hitting. That makes sense? So... Turret damage can be much more spikier. Turrets can crit with their wrecking shots, um, but turrets can also miss. Turrets do up to 150% of their normal damage. Missiles will do a calculated amount of damage up to the maximum amount of damage for that missile. Um, okay. Why am I saying all of that? Because in general, because of this, Missiles are known for being able to apply to things smaller than them, right? You may not do much damage, but you'll usually almost always do some, right? Like a missile, you'll always scrape the paint, whereas a turret, you just could miss all day. A, missiles will, a missile will always do as much damage as it can based on its formula. Um... And then the rapid missile launchers take this concept to its logical extreme. So what a rapid missile launcher does is it takes the, the missile from a size category below it and it shoots it really, really quickly as a way of being a weapon system of its size, right? So the medium weapon systems, you have the heavy assault missile launcher and the, uh, for your short range and the heavy launcher for your long range. But then you have your rapid light missile launcher. Light missiles are a frigate-sized weapon. Right, rapid light missile launchers take those light missiles and shoot them very fast. So that way it shoots the light missiles fast enough that it's taking a frigate-level weapon and doing cruiser-level damage with it. This is important because, remember, the missiles determine how much damage is applied to the opponent. So these, these one size category, smaller weapon systems have the application of that smaller missile. So if you shoot rapid light missiles at a frigate, you are shooting a frigate sized weapon at a frigate. Whereas if you shot heavy missiles at it, you'd be shooting a medium sized weapon at a frigate. Now, for everything except for the Dreadnought-sized ones, um, I think. Yeah. So for, for the cruiser and battleship-sized weapons, for the medium and large weapon systems, the it fires the long-range missile below it, right? So light missiles are the long-range missile system for small weapons. Mediums fire rapid lights. Heavy missiles are the long-range weapon system for uh, mediums, therefore, the heavy missile launcher, or the, the, sorry, the large weapon system fires rapid heavies. This is because, you know, as you go up in size, you generally be able to shoot further. And so, basically, the, the long-range weapon system of the size category down becomes 
effectively a normal ranged weapon system when you step up to the to the range up. So that is one of the reasons why a lot of missile systems are particularly de deadly at punching down, right? Um, a a caracal armed with rapid light missile uh, missile launchers are is very effective at killing frigates. Far more effective than killing, uh, you know, other cruisers or battle cruisers. Uh, the practical downside of this, though, is that while rapid missile launchers are very bursty, they put a lot of damage up front. The, the they also have a huge reload time, uh, forty five seconds to uh, thirty to forty five seconds. So if we look at the light missile launcher two. It has a reload time of 10 seconds. The rapid light missile launcher has a reload time of 35 seconds. There you go. So this reload time is deadly. So this thing is going to do very bursty damage. Sorry. This is going to do very bursty damage. It fires at 6.24 seconds unmodified. Um... But it only carries a few missiles. I can't remember exactly how many it is. It's like 20-something. Whereas the light missile launcher has a 10-second reload time and a 12-second rate of fire. So, uh, in other words, this rapid light is firing twice as fast as the light missile launcher. Um, but it, it, when it goes into reload, it's a sit and duck. So very good for burst, not good for sustain. And honestly, there's not that much to talk about uh, missiles as a weapon system different than, tur uh, than turrets. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the other strange weapon system, the Vortron Projector. Now I actually let know less about this weapon system than normal, but uh, this is part of the Edencom uh, uh, ships. Just like the Disintegrator is part of the Triglavian ships. One of the things that's a, a, to note about both of those weapon systems, the Vortron Projectors and the Entropic Disintegrators, is that unlike these other weapon systems, these are exclusively used with a single one of them on a given, wep uh, on a given ship. So Triglavians only have a single Entropic Disintegrator. Edencom ships only have a single small Vortron Projector. Now, um, when... Uh, when they, when the small Vortron projector fires, what it does is it uses actually a combination of stats between, uh, turrets and, um, missiles. Let's try to figure it out. The first thing it does is it checks the optimal range. The optimal range determines how far the Vortron can shoot. Okay. So if the target is within 22 kilometers, congratulations, you can shoot at them. I don't believe that there is a falloff. Um, now, once you've hit, then it does damage to that target and begins to chain to other targets. So this Voltron arc range uh, ability, this is how far it can arc between different targets. So as long as there is another, it can arc between 10 different targets. And as long as there's another target within 10 kilometers, it will jump to it. Um, now, when it does its damage, though, it does damage as if it was a missile. So once again, you have explosion velocity and explosion radius. So it is a math based formula, just like missiles, that uses optimal range like a turret and will chain between different things. Hopefully that's not too confusing. It probably is. Okay. Now then, let's talk a little bit about the uh the size or the different types of ammo as far as like tier goes. There is, for any given weapon system, the Tech 1, a set of Faction, and then usually a set of Tech 2. 
No, yeah, usually a set of faction. Yeah, tech one, tech two, faction. So, in general, the tech one is your normal stuff that we've looked at. Now, the tech two, what tech two normally does is tech two will take the long range ammo and the short range ammo and will improve them. Maybe not the shortest range and the longest range, but somewhere in there, right? So in this case, the Scorch is a Tech 2 Ultraviolet. And Conflag is a Tech 2 X-Ray. Right? Let me, let me just double check that. Oh, I'm missing out. Hold on. Let me just double check that. X-ray, industry, blueprint copy, research, and flag. There you go. So X-ray becomes can flag. Uh, and gosh darn it, hold on. I need tech two guns so that way I can have tech two ammo. Uh, that's beam. Damn it. There you go. So, con conflagration is tech 2 x-ray. Uh, scorch is tech 2 ultraviolet. Likewise, uh, with beams, with the long range one, you have a different set of tech 2 crystals. So, this is another thing, where the tech 1 weapon systems share the same ammunition, the Tech 2 weapon systems are different, okay? So in this case, Aurora is the long range, with Radio being one of the longest range crystals in the game, and Gleam is your short range, with Multifrequency being the shortest range crystal in the game. Uh, so, and this is true about all of the other weapon systems too, pretty much, that, that two of the ammo will, will upgrade into the short range ammo, two of them will sh upgrade into the short, uh, long range ammo. Um... So, then you have your faction. Faction is basically the same as Tech 1. There's a faction version for each of the Tech 1. With more or less two different kinds of faction. And we'll see this pattern throughout. Where, when we say faction, there's kind of two different kinds of faction. So you have standard, and then you have the... Well, actually, this is uh, a good... Well, you have Standard, and then you have, like, the Navy faction, which Blood and Sancha has their own kind of low tier. Um, but the, the Navy faction is often better than the normal, but then the Pirate faction, the good Pirate faction, in this, in this case, the Dark Blood and the True Sancha, are going to be the best, right? So they're even going to be better than the normal uh, faction stuff. So in this case, you can see that the standard S does 5 damage, 3 thermal, uh, whereas the highest damage one does 6 damage, or 6 and 3.6, um, which is pretty good. I thought that they shot further, too. Some of them will do that. Um, but when you move up to tech 2, though, it gets a little bit different. Shoot. Here, we can see that Tech 2 does significantly more damage than even the Faction 1, right? So Faction True Sancha does 7.2, the T2 equivalent does 8.9. So why not just use the Tech 2? Well, there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, if you can see, the range bonus for the Conflag is, cut, is, is much ser more serious than the Faction 1. The Factions will shoot further. Uh, then Tech 2. But also, the tracking speed. This is a big one. In general, Tech 2 uh, ammo reduce the damage, or sorry, increase the damage of the ammo while reducing the application, right? So in missiles, in, miss in the case of missiles, it'll make the explosion velocity uh, lower and the explosion radius bigger. 
in tra in ammo or turrets, it'll e suppress the tracking speed. There is an exception to this, which is long range of certain kinds of ammo. So, for instance, or sorry, short range of certain short range of certain kinds of long range ammo. So, if I go to beans, I look at tech two. All right, uh, so here you can see, actually, you know, it's the same stuff, more damage for the Tech 2. Um, you know, Gleam does a little bit more damage than multi-frequency. Um, and Aurora does more damage than radio. But in this case, the long-range ammo reduces tracking, while the short-range ammo increases tracking. The reason why this is is because the when the long range ammo is using short range weapons you now have the tracking of a long range weapon but you're engaging at a short range weapon profile therefore the short range weapon actually improves your tracking speed let's see if that pattern holds true Yep, there you go. Javelin increases it 1.25 versus the spike, which reduces it to 25%. Likewise, uh... well, I don't think uh, missiles are, are kind of a unique stuff like too. We'll talk about T2 missiles in a second. Artillery. Oops. What time is it? Oh, good. We still got plenty of time. Uh, Quake and Tremor, right? Yeah. So remove these. Once again, long range, short, uh, the short range ammo for the long range weapon system has a tracking bonus while the other one has a penalty. So this is, that's pretty much true. Um, for all the other weapon systems, including the short-range ammo, there's a tracking penalty such that uh, it makes it so that you're harder to apply, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. With missiles, we can see that the explosion radius is... Not uh, is the same for everything except for Nova Rage. Rage for missiles are well rockets. They all have a different name, man. So the Rage is uh the the short is the high damage one, and Javelin is the long range one, right? So in this case, the Nova Rage rocket is is the most damage, but it also makes your uh, it harder to hit. It increases your explosion radius, which, remember, makes it so that they have to be bigger in order to take full damage. And it reduces your explosion velocity, which means they have to be going slower to take more damage. Um, likewise, the or on the other hand, the Javelin... The Javelin goes way faster. Three... Uh, three over 3k a second where everything else is just over 2k a second with Nova with rage being less than 2k. So, uh, javelin in missiles is the long range missile system. Rage is the short range, bad application, high damage missile uh, uh, missile type. And then of course the, uh, the faction stuff, um, as the same applicational ability, but higher damage, right? You've got Garistus with the high, Dread Garistus with the highest damage, Kaldari Navy below it, and Standard Garistus below that. Boom. And this goes uh, the same up the route. Um, if we go to Light Missiles...
we'll see that uh once again the precision missiles will have better accuracy oh actually this is different that's right precision missiles have better accuracy but shorter uh distance fury has lowered accuracy but greater distance and greater damage so fury is better damage and better range lower accuracy precision lets you do damage to things that are smaller but you do less once again this is because the focus of missile systems are about punching down so they have special missiles that are designed to hit things smaller than them and then for the uh, heavy assault we have rage and javelin again and then for heavy missiles how much do you want to bet precision and fury so that pattern holds great Now then, since, since we've uh, basically just gotten through weapon systems, let's move on. Uh, I'm sure that there's a little bit of weapon system stuff that I've missed. Go ahead and throw stuff out there if I have, and we might circle back onto it. But I do want to keep going. In addition to weapon systems, though, we do have other things that can go into our high slots. We can have um, what's called utility high, which are... Things that are put into your high slots that are not necessarily weapons, they're not turrets or launchers, but they give you some sort of utility. The first kind of utility high would be, um, okay, fine, we'll start with that. Smart bombs. Smart bombs are AOE abilities that are centered on the ship itself. The smaller the smaller the smart bomb, the smaller the the radius of the explosion, and depending on the smart bomb determines which damage type you're doing. Actually, at this point, I feel like we should take a step back and recircle back to damage types and talk a little bit about the racial specialties. I've we've mentioned that the races have a specialty of each weapon system. So, Mimitar for projectiles, Amar for energy weapons, Kaldari and Galente for um, hybrids, etc. But each race, as, I've no as I noted earlier, there are four damage types total. Um, and each race is focused on one of those damage types in some way or another. Um, the Kaldari are focused on kinetic the Galente to Thermal, the Amar to EM, and the Mimitar to Explosive. Now, this fact keeps coming up over and over and over again. Whenever there's a damage type to, uh, to relate to something, it relates to that race's damage type. Okay? So in this case, each uh, there there is a Smart Bomb per damage type as well. Um, but... If you notice, like, for instance, lasers do EM Therm, which is, you know, at, uh, Amar are EM focused. The Mimitar do all kinds of damage, but they're one of the only ones that can consistently do explosive. So they're explosive focused. The Kaldari uh, missiles can do whatever, but they, a, lot of their miss, a lot of their ships are actually bonused only for kinetic missiles. Uh, also, drones. The race is drones will do damage of uh, of that race's type. And we're going to get there in a little bit, hopefully. But uh, T2 resist profiles for each ship class is based on the enemy's damage type. So, for instance, Mimitar ships, uh, ships in T2 have an above-average EM resistance because EM is a Mars racial damage. Likewise, the Kaldari, their shields, even in T2, still have 0% EM resistances, but really good thermal resistance because the Galente are their enemy, right? So uh, just something to think about. Each race has a damage type. 
it applies to their pirates, it applies to them, it applies to the damage they do, it applies to the damage their opponent resists, etc. Uh, okay. Smart bombs. Different damage types, different rages. Mostly you're going to see smart bombs used for a few things. One, they're good at clearing drones. Two, they're good at uh, sitting on a gate and blowing up pods and, and shuttles and stuff that are flying around. They are extremely dangerous to use in high security space because if anybody, if you nick somebody who you're not, uh, who is, uh, you know, not a suspect or something like that, then you are going to get concorded. So uh, smart bombs are very dangerous in high security space. Doesn't mean they're not used by people. Um, sometimes like people who are ratting, lots, lots of little ships, you want to use a smart bomb. Be careful. Excuse me. Uh, somebody might sneak up on you cloaked and catch you, and then you get concorded. Next, we have the assistance modules. Remote shield boosters and remote armor repairers. The, and re remote capacitor uh, thingies. <laughs> uh, remote capacitor transmitters, remote armor repairers, and remote... Field repairs. So we'll talk. Uh, let's talk a little bit about tank now. Um, uh, actually, I don't. Uh, you know what? I need a. I need a potty break. So we're going to time out, and then we're going to come back and talk about tank. And we are back. Uh, before I jump into this, is there anything I've really... Uh, does anybody feel like I've missed anything? Especially when it comes to turrets that I should circle back on. Did I miss something? Did I... Otherwise, we'll jump back into it and go to tank. Yeah. The resist profiles of the T2 ships are based on the main enemy of their faction's damage profile. I'm sure that we missed something. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Well, if I did miss something, go ahead and put it in the comments down below if you're watching it on YouTube. How about that? Why is the Trigs not Omni Tank when the ancient enemy has Sasha is Omni Damage? That's a good question. Uh, I have no idea. Well, actually, I would suggest that, uh, because the, oh, I have the answer to that, actually. I have a real answer to that. The real answer to that is because the Trig don't build their T2 ships. The T2 Trig ships are built by empires. Yes, this is going up as a YouTube video.
All right, let's jump into tank. Uh, there are, first of all, the word tank in EVE has a different meaning than a lot of other video games. In uh, most MMOs, the word tank represents a person, right? Um, hold on. Tech 1 tank is not is not based on enemy profile, it's based on ship profile. Or, you know, Tech 1 resists are different. Um... So in a, in a normal MMO, a tank is a person that is uh, designed to take all the damage and also has all of the mitigation abilities to be able to like uh, prevent or to reduce the amount of damage that's done. Maybe has some annoying abilities to make it so that they can't they have to be the one that gets messed with or you know whatever. In Eve, the tank is effectively your your strategy for staying alive, right? So there are solid tanks. There, there's like concrete ideas of tanks, armor, shield, hull. And then there's kind of more abstract uh, concepts like SIG tanking, speed tanking, flex tanking, honor tanking, you know, whatever. Uh, right now we're going to focus on the big two, armor and shield. People can hull tank, but we will talk about that later. Uh, armor and shields. There is uh, a lot of little differences between armor and shields. We will talk about more of them later when we dive into the uh, medium and low slot modules. First and foremost, media, uh, shields use medium slots, where armor generally uses low slots. Um, but in this case, because we're dealing with armor repairers specifically, the armor repairs of shields and armor are different in shields the repair happens at the beginning of the cycle when you hit f1 it heals them and then it circles around and gets to the bottom and when it gets to the end it heals them again and if you shut it off then it goes down and it just stops with the armor it's the opposite it heals at the end of the repair at the cycle so it goes around the circle, completes, and then repairs. Goes around the cycle again. Even if you stop it, it gets to the end and repairs one last time, and then it's over. So shields are way more responsive, while armor is way less responsive. Also, shields in general take more power and have bigger bursty uh, repair amounts, where armor uh, is slower and has lower uh, repair amounts. So, in this case, we have shield repair, uh, remote shield repair, and remote armor repair. Both are decent. God, let me get some piloting going on here. Uh, both will work. There are definitely logistics or uh, healers of both types, but they have to take that into consideration, the, the rep at the beginning or the end. And also, just like the difference between turrets, uh, projectiles, and energy turrets, we'll see a similar or uh, we'll see a pattern with the reppers. So if I open up the armor repairer and then get a small remote shield repairer. If we look, the optimal range ah, the optimal range of the armor is much higher the armor repairer can extend twice as far as the shield repairer before it hits into fall off but likewise uh, just like a laser armor has a very low fall off so you get up to seven kilometers but then shortly thereafter, you're no longer getting as much effectiveness. Shields, on the other hand, begin their fall off sooner, but fall off slower. And also get further, too, if you look at it. This thing has a total of 10.5. This one has a total of 9.5. So, um, so, yeah. And how much it repairs and all that sort of stuff, cycle time, there's a lot of little differences to there. I'm just trying to talk about, like, 
the big fundamentals, right? So there you go when it comes to repair modules. We'll talk a little bit. I'm sure we'll talk more about it later. Uh, actually, there is one more thing I wanted to point out, which is that when it comes to armor rep or repairs, remote or um, remote or local, there is what's called the ancillary repairer. Now, each tank type has a weakness, okay? The weakness of the shield tank is that shield boosters are very cap in inefficient. They consume a lot of capacitor for the amount of hit points that they do. Uh, they may rep relatively quickly, but they don't uh, but they consume a lot of capacitor for what they rep. Armor reps, on the other hand, are very efficient in their reps in that sort of way, but they rep much less, right? Um, what this ends up meaning is that, or uh, another piece of this is that because of the nature of things, you tend to have uh, maybe multiple shield reppers, and, or sorry, mul uh, multiple armor reppers, but only one shield repper. Um... The ancillary tries to use a secondary component in order to augment the weakness of that tank type. So in the case of the shields that uses too much capacitor, an ancillary shield repper will take capacitor charges, cap boosters, which are usually used in, in cap rechargers to boost up your cap. Like these are little units that have little chunks of capacitor in them, right? Well, you can load them into an ancillary sh shield repper and use it instead of your ship's capacitor. So now your shield, your shield booster, which normally takes most capacitor, takes zero capacitor. So you could actually oversize your shield rep pretty effectively that way because you don't have to pay the cost of repping. You only have to fit it via power grid and CPU. Now, when they run out of charges... Just like the rapid light or the rapid missile launchers, it has a very slow reload time. Um, 60 seconds, a full minute to reload the ancillary shield repper. And continuing to use it while it is running, while it has no boosts, if you, if you use it without the cap rechargers, because it's designed to work with the cap rechargers, it actually will consume more cap than a normal sh shield booster. Likewise, armor reps suffer from not enough oomph behind them, right? Like an armor rep doesn't do enough per cycle. So rather than using cap, cap boosters in order to uh, you know, reduce the cap requirements, they instead use... Uh, shoot, clicked on the wrong one. They use... Nanite repair paste. Nanite repair paste is normally used to repair damaged uh, overheated modules. But in this case, you load up the nanite repair paste to augment your armor repper. So when this thing has nanite repair paste on it, it does like way more than even the better, best uh, normal armor, armor repper per cycle. But once again, when it runs out, it has a 60 second reload time and... Uh, if you continue to rep it with it after it runs out of charges, it will actually re repair less than a Tech 2 module of, uh, you know, Tech 2 armor repair module. So, Ansil, much like Rapids, are about upfront bursty uh, repairs with a long reload. Okay, next... We'll, we'll talk, we might, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll circle back on that in a little bit. Um, next for high slots. We have capacitor. Remote capacitor transfers. Remote capacitor transfers uh, will consume some of, consume some of your cap and give some to your opponent. Um, Oh, that's actually a really good uh, point to point out, Zach, which is that in particular, the ancillary shield wrapper, it does not matter how big of a cap charge you use in it. It will just consume one cap charge regardless. 
Therefore, the most uh, you will always want to use the smallest cap charge that is that can fit in it. So that way you can fit the most charges in it. Okay. Um, shield. Okay. Remote shield. Oh yeah. Smallest Navy cap charge because Navy cap charges are smaller than normal cap charges. Okay. Um, capacitor transmitters will consume some of your capacitor to give capacitor to your ally. So here it uses 38 gigajoules and transmits 30. So you consume 38, your ally gets 30. But if you go up to tech 2, 41 and 39. That's way closer. You're now getting almost as much energy to the ally as you are getting the, as you are consuming yourself. However, there are actually ships that are bonused for remote capacitor transmitters. Do you remember how I told you that one of the races way back two hours ago, when I said one of the races not only is not only are they divided by armor and shield, but they're deter they're they're divided into fleet and skirmish. This is one of the things that I'm talking about. Two, uh, the, uh, the, the, the repair and support ships for each race. We call these ships logistics ships. The Tech 2 is actually called logistics frigates and logistics cruisers. But we just refer to the entire group as logistics, right? Um, so the ones that are fleet-oriented which to remind you is the Kaldari and the Amar, their logistics cruisers have a bonus for capacitor transmitters. What does that mean? That means if we go for the Augurer, which is that Amar logistics cruiser that we were looking at earlier, that Amar, oh my gosh. If I can spell, let's open up the ship browser again. The, uh, you mean the Basilisk in the Guardian. Alright, so if we pull up the Augurer into here. Now the Augurer has a bonus to remote armor repair amount. A reduction in 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 activation cost, but here, look at this roll bonus. Now, a roll bonus means that you get the bonus regardless of how many skills that you have in it. A Mar Cruiser bonus means that, like, depending on what skill level you have, will determine how big of a bonus this is. Roll bonuses always get it. So this is a thousand percent increase to remote capacitor range and a two hundred percent bonus to remote capacitor transfer amount. Wait a minute, hold up. Let's think about that for a second. It consumed 41 and transmitted 39. This does not increase the cost, but does increase the transfer amount. So if we take this remote capacitor... Oh man, I so was hoping that that would work. Um, if we take this and we put it on here, and then we look at it, we will see with the bonuses applied that it actually costs 30 gigajoules to use and transmits 117 capacitor. This is making capacitor out of nothing. This is why you see those big fleets with the lines drawn between them. Those lines are the, the, uh, the logistics ships that have created what's called a cap chain. Okay? Each they basically, you know, logi ship one caps to logi ship two, which caps to logi ship three, which caps to logi ship one. And between them, that does two things. One, it dramatically increases the amount of capacitor that they have at their disposal. But more important almost more importantly, too, it makes the entire chain Harder to disrupt. Now, a disruption is more destructive because if you take out one part of the chain, then the entire rest of the chain needs to adapt. 
Yeah, if you can jam them, for example, or destroy one. However, if you just try to n energy neutralize one, you know, if you have a soul, if you have a uh, a lone logistics cruiser or uh, say a Glente one that doesn't have these kinds of cap transfer bonuses, and you nude them out, they're dead in the water. In this case, if you nude them out. They'll just have to wait one one cycle, and then their ally will give them more capacitor, and then they can keep giving out more capacitor, and the chain survives. So it is very difficult to break these kinds of chains with just straight-up capacitor warfare. You would have to go with, like, jamming them out with electronic warfare. Um, and even then, because those ships know that that's their weakness, often will... Special, you know, fit modules that make it so that, that it's even harder for them to jam it, too. So, this is part of the secret of how, um, especially logistics ships, work. Because they can make capacitor from nothing by working together. Okay? Let's move on. Next, we have energy NOSes and energy neutralizers. So, in the same way that those capacitor transfers are able to give people capacitor, energy neutralizers and energy Nosferatus attack the opponent's capacitor. In the same way that weapons do damage to their hit points, neutralizers do damage to their capacitor. Now, we haven't really talked about this very much because it's a different kind of concept, but capacitor is basically like your mana it's your energy it's your active abilities when things like weapons or propulsion modules or repair modules go off it they consume a certain amount of capacitor per use per cycle and if you don't have enough capacitor for them they don't work so by neutralizing them out if you can cut off their their capacitor you have left them dead in the water and um they have significantly lowered defenses they have significantly, they're significantly slower because they can't use their propulsion modules. And uh, if they're using hybrids or lasers, you could even shut off their weapon systems. Uh, we'll talk more about drones in a little bit. So, energy neutralizers are direct attack at opponent's capacitor. Energy Nosferatus are a little bit different. Ener while, en while energy neutralizers are designed to destroy your opponent's capacitor, energy Nosferatus are designed to use your opponent's capacitor to maintain your own stability. Okay? Uh, Nosferatu is named after the vampire of old, right? So these, rather than just destroying your opponent's capacitor, actually steals their capacitor for yourself. This does a couple of things, uh, or this makes a couple of changes from the standard uh, neutralizer. So let's look. The energy neutralizer versus NOS. First of all, they have basically the same range. Uh, the NOS does not take capacitor but will gain you capacitor. Uh, the neutralizer damages capacitor. I'm actually really surprised that this does more capacitor damage. Why, why is that true? I thought that the newts did more. Maybe it's because of bonuses? Either way, normally speaking, the neutralizer attacks, it does more damage to the capacitor uh, at, at expense of... Oh, I'm stupid. I was looking at cycle time. Okay, so this will will steal eight units per cycle, and will cycle almost three times. So, twenty four units in the same time it takes for this small energy neutralizer to go off once, and this small energy neutralizer will will do forty five. So the small energy neutralizer will hit for more newt. Then the Nosferatu will. But the Nosferatu has another restriction, which I referred to earlier. The energy Nosferatu will not work if your capacitor is greater than your opponent's capacitor. So, 
And I believe that that's, shoot, I can never remember if it's based on percentage or based on uh, total value. Somebody can tell me about that or not. Well, basically, if you are below their capacitor and you use a NOS on them, you steal their capacitor and keep them on you. If you use a Nosferatu on them and you do not have, uh, and you have more capacitor than them, then it will do nothing. And in fact, let me look real quick, because I think I'm reasonably sure. Yeah, the medium. No, I, I here I thought Nosferatu's took uh, activation cost. Um, yes, I know that commander. I actually already mentioned that. Um, I think it is. I think it is uh, percentage based. So. If your capacitor's percentage is lower than your opponent's capacitor's percentage, then it will drain. Um, that is why I say that this is designed to stabilize your capacitor. Because it doesn't drain, it doesn't damage their capacitor very much, and it won't bring them below a certain threshold, but it will keep you up, right? If you're brought down, then you can keep your the NOS going in order to stabilize your own capacitor. Um, especially if you're getting nuded out, this will cycle and give you extra capacitor that lets you keep going. Now, the Blood Raider ships, which we talked about earlier, have a special bonus that makes it so that they will their energy Nosferatu's work regardless of the opponent's capacitor. They'll just drain and give it to you all day long. So the only consideration with the blood with the Blood Raider stuff is to see whether or not how fast you want to destroy their capacitor. You want to just you want to destroy it quickly and therefore use a neutralizer or destroy it not as quickly and do it as a Nosferatu, which will keep you more stable, right? Because this consumes capacitor and this gives you capacitor. So that's capacitor warfare. Oh, uh, we'll talk about this. Or, there is a mid-slot module, the capacitor battery, that will provide resistance to these drains, and it works against all of these drains. Ha, Zach! Got to it before you even said it. Next, we have... We're not even going to touch those right now. Uh, the auto-targeting system. This is an often maligned or misunderstood uh, one that if you click on it, it will automatically lock hostile ships around you. Uh, that is not particularly useful to a lot of people, but uh, one of the interesting advantages of this uh, module is that it gives you a max an increase in your maximum number of locks. Now, I haven't really talked about this, but every ship has a maximum number of locks it can make. So this augurer is eight, for example. Or uh, if I go with this omen, where this omen can only have six. Now, your skills can also affect this. Specifically, um, let's go look at this real quick. The targeting skills with... Target management and advanced target management, each giving you an additional target. So you start with two, and target management and advanced target management each give you five more. So, but you still can't target. Basically, you can target the number of targets uh, equal to your uh, your personal maximum or the ship's maximum, whichever is lowest. So, if you can lock. 11 different targets by your skills, but your ship can only lock six. If you put an auto targeting system on top, hey, look, now it can lock eight. This is also kind of important because in certain places, i.e. places that are owned by the Triglavians, they have a tendency to cut how many targets that you can have locked in half. And so this allows you to still lock an extra target. Next is cloaking systems. There are three kinds of cloaking systems. The first one is the prototype cloaking system. All three cloaks can only be used by Omegas. The standard pro prototype is just normal. It's uh, It just lets you cloak. Cloaking does a couple of penalties. One, it makes you way slower. 
too. It makes you way uh, harder to lock. But more importantly, when you come out of the cloak, you have a thing called sensor recalibration time, which is a period of time in which you're just not allowed to cloak after you've come out of a cloak. So this cloak will slow you down by 90% when activated. And when it deactivates, won't activate again for 18 seconds. Uh, sorry, my bad. Will not allow you to lock something for 18 seconds. But then there's also a reactivation delay of 30 seconds. So you're 90% slower. When you decloak, you have 18 seconds before you can even begin to lock anything. And 30 seconds before you can try to cloak again. Not a great cloak, but it definitely gets the job done. And when you're cloaked, you appear, you don't appear anywhere. Right, you can't be descanned. The only well, you'll you'll appear in local. You'll you'll appear in chat groups. That's it. Not in descan. Not on grid. You're completely invisible. Now, if a physical object, if a decloaked object, uh, comes within range of you, within two thousand or two kilometers, that will forcibly decloak you. This is not true about a gate cloak or something like that, like the cloak that you get from, from jumping through a gate. Only these kinds of cloaks. Next is the improved cloaking device. Now, this is the Tech 2 version. It, it requires cloaking 3. It's super fancy. This is the best cloaking device that normal ships can fit onto them. It only reduces your velocity by 75%, and it has the reactivation delay still of 30 seconds. Um, it also has a sensor recalibration time of 20 seconds. I wonder why this one was green and the other one was not. This is 30 seconds. And sensor recalibration time of 30 seconds, reactivation delay of 30 seconds. Whereas the uh, improved cloaking device, I don't know why my skills applied on that one. Uh, you have... 20 seconds calibration time, 30 seconds reactivation. So in 20 seconds, you can fire, you can start to lock in, uh, and you're going 75% speed. Now, as you could tell by, by the numbers earlier, my skills can change all of these. This is true about all of them. And if the number is green, that means that an ability or something is impacting that stat for the better. If the stat is red, then that means there's something impacting that stat for the worst. Um, this cloak is important for in particular, hauling ships, because uh, there's a trick known as the micro warp drive trick, which we'll talk about, uh, or maybe we'll, we won't, but whatever. Uh, you can use a micro warp drive to get into warp faster than normal. However, the improved cloaking device combined with that allows you to potentially do this cloaked. So the idea here is that you can warp when you're 70% of the speed, your maximum speed in the correct direction of your warp. So the micro warp drive increases your speed beyond your normal speed, such that the moment that your micro warp drive shuts off, you're now going fast enough that you're, that you basically instantly go into warp. Well, the 90% speed reduction of a prototype cloaking device often will reduce your speed enough that that doesn't work. But the improved cloaking device at their 75% reduction, especially with skills reducing that more, can make it so that that is good enough, such that you can begin your micro warp drive cycle while you cloak as, right away while you're aligning. And then as the micro warp drive is finishing up, you turn off your cloak and boom, you're gone. It's super cool, but it does require some fiddling. That is the primary, I would say that that's one of the biggest uses for this cloaking device. Uh, as well as like cloaking huge ships. I, would, I doubt I'm even 20% done. This might even be a multiple day thing. Uh, okay. Finally, we have the Covert Ops cloaking device. Covert Ops cloaking devices can only be fit to certain ships. These ships here. The, uh, the Covert Ops Tech 2 ships. Force Recon, so half of the different Recon ships. Um, the Prospect, which is a mining ship. Blockade Runners and Stealth Bombers. Those are the ship... Cat oh, and Strategic Cruisers can fit uh, Covert Ops cloaking device with a specific subsystems. Those are the types of ships that can use it. But then there are individual ships that can use it. The Stratios is an individual ship. The Astero is an individual ship. Victory uh, Luxury Yacht. 
Um, Stratius Emergency Responder is a special type of Stratius. Don't even worry about that. And these one, the other ones, the the Atana and the Rabisu, are actually just extremely rare ships. You might as well just ignore them for now. So a covert ops cl cloaking sh uh, device is only able to be used on a very small subselection of ships, but it has a 10 second recal recalibration time. It does not reduce your velocity. And most importantly, unlike all of those other cloaks, the Covert Ops cloaking device allows you to warp while cloaked. This is what allows Covert Ops and Stealth Bombers and all these kinds of ships to be so effective. They can warp while cloaked. They can move around while they're invisible. They can hunt down targets invisibly. And as long as you don't get within 2K of them, you will never be seen. Pretty cool. And yes, there are certain ships, uh, in particular recon ships, that have bonuses that make it for that recalibration delay. Next. Uh, tractor beams. Tractor beams are useful for grabbing cans or wrecks and bringing them to you. The small tractor beam goes out to... Uh, 20 kilometers... The Tech 2 goes to 24 kilometers. Next, we have the bursts. Okay, so we've talked about support and, and in the use of like repairing other people. But there's another kind of support, which is buffing people. And that's where command bursts come in. Battle cruisers, command ships, and command destroyers, as well as capitals, can fit command bursts. Command bursts are are two different. Are there's four different kinds of command bursts. There's armor, shield. Well, five. Armor, shield, skirmish, and information. The fifth is mining. So armor and shield are pretty straightforward. Information, it generally is designed to focus around your ship's, like, sensoring abilities, sensor abilities, and your electronic warfare. And skirmishes are about, like, speed, mostly. Each burst has three different scripts that can be used with it. Each script is the burst itself, right? So, in this case, armor bursts have armor energizing charges, which increases everybody's resistances. Armor reinforcement charges, which increases everybody's hip, uh, armor hit points. And rapid repair charges, which increases uh, both rep speed and reduces the cost of that rep such that it doesn't like cost more capacitor. You just rep faster and therefore more. Likewise, shields kind of have the same exact thing. You have active shield charging, which is shield reps. Uh, shield extension, which is shield hit points, and shield harmonizing, which is shield resistances. Skirmishes have evasive maneuvers. We'll just double check these. Uh, evasive maneuvers are... Reduces your signature radius, which makes you... Again, signature radius is how effectively large you are. So this makes you smaller. An agility bonus makes you... Uh, a little bit faster and also allows you to change speed faster. So you're a little bit faster and a little bit smaller and harder to hit. Now, these percentages seem small, but they get amplified quickly uh, based on the ship that's doing the bursting, the skills of the person doing the bursting, and whether or not they have a specific implant that increases their bursting. This can go up to like 30 to 50% almost. Uh, depending on, on how it is. And that's a huge, huge bonus when it comes to these kinds of fights. Um, or, you know, when it comes to these kinds of things. So, the interdiction maneuvers uh, will increase your web range, right? We, we haven't really talked about this, but you learn about webs in the basic tutorial. Webs course are a mid slot uh, uh, e war module that reduces your opponent's speed webs are notoriously short ranged this increases the your web range by a lot that is really good uh and then finally rapid deployment which simply just increases your speed with an afterburner or micro warp drive just raw you go faster so once again skirmishes are all about like speed right making you go faster making your opponent go slower Information, on the other hand, is all about your systems. 
In this case, you have sensor strength, which is your resistance to being jammed, um, and a reduction in sensor dampeners and weapon disruption. So this will reduce the effectiveness of weapon disruption and sensor dampening on your ship when this is active. The next you have, uh, that's electronic hardening. So that makes your systems far more resistant. Electronic superiority increases the range and strength bonuses of your electronic warfare modules. So all of your, uh, all of the non-web electronic warfare modules um, will be impacted by this. It mean, which includes sensor dampeners, weapon disruptors, target painters, and electronic countermeasure modules. Uh, all of them have their range increased with this one. And then finally, sensor optimization, which increases your scan resolution bonus, which uh, determines how fast you can lock things. And it increases your targeting range bonus, which uh, determines how far you can lock things. Uh, basically, the exact opposite of sensor dampening. So this, again, uh, information warfare is mostly about targeting and e-war effectiveness, where uh, the skirmish is about speed. Mining formants is, of course, about mining. Now, each burst can only use one of these module uh, of these uh, uh, charges at a time and therefore you have to pick and depending on the ship you don't actually get all uh, you know you, it's hard to get all of the bursters because for instance uh, battle cruisers can fit one command burst uh, command ships can fit two command bursts I think hold on yeah two command bursts and then some other things that can you pick command burst, I think are also two. I can't think of anything that does three by default. Check the orca. Yeah, oh no. The orca can fit three, and I think capitals can start to fit them. Either way, whatever. So usually one to two, sometimes three. Uh, command destroyers can only fit one as well. Now, there is a special rig that will increase the amount of command uh, command processors that you can or command bursts that you can use but that takes up a rig slot and these command bursters also take up a high slot and a lot of uh, fitting room so usually only ships that are dedicated to command uh, bursts will use those however like a battle cruiser gang is particularly nasty because battle cruisers can even the tech one version can bring a burst per and even not fired by the best of skills, some of these bursts are extremely useful. So that's bursts. Oh, also, bursts have a range when they go off. Different ships have different burst uh, bonuses for that. So obviously, you only affect the target, the uh, ships that are within your range. Next. I'm skipping over anything that is is, is about super ca or capitals or super capitals, by the way. I'll leave that for another time. Probably another person. Uh, harvesting equipment is almost exclusively stuff about mining or gas stuffing, except for salvagers. Salvagers allow you to salvage uh, enemy or wrecks out there, right? Now, while it does create a suspect flag for stealing from a wreck... Uh, i.e. taking the loot out of a wreck, and a suspect flag means that anyone in, it can attack you anywhere for 15 minutes without any repercussion whatsoever. Uh, besides, you can now fire at them. Uh, you can salvage without triggering a suspect flag. So if you see wrecks out there, like on a, if, if a bunch of people have fought on a gate or something like that, you can salvage all of the wrecks and get the salvage from that, and salvage is used to build rigs for people. So this is how you get the parts to build rigs. So salvagers are really good to keep uh, around if you just want to make a little bit of extra money with your utility high. Uh, we did remote armor. Certain modules, uh, the specifically the... Oh, yeah. So the interdiction nullifier, I guess this is a kind of utility high is also very specific on what it's allowed to be used on. 
uh, interceptors, blockade runners, deep space transports, strategic cr cruisers, the yacht again, covert ops, and industrials. All of these ships can fit and use this industri uh, this interdiction nullification. So there are two different kinds, well, technically three different kinds of warp disruption, i.e. Uh, ways to prevent somebody from being able to warp away. Uh, the first two are, are scrams and disruptors, which we'll talk about when we get to mid slots. But the third is warp disruption bubbles, which you'll see in null security space. These bubbles are giant spheres that prevent anybody from warping into or out of them unless they're interdiction nullified. Okay, so these modules give you 10 seconds of being completely immune to those bubbles. So it doesn't matter if they bubble the gate, you can warp out of them and you can warp into them. However, fitting these interdiction nullifications greatly nerfs your scan resolution bonus, making it very difficult to target people, greatly reduces your maximum targeting range bonuses, making it harder to target people, and halves the number of drones that you're allowed to use at one time. So even if you could target them, like the drones are notorious for being able to like go after people even if you can't target them, but e this makes it so that even that doesn't work. Um, so this, and it does have a reactivation delay, so you have to be targeted in how you use it. However, many of these ships have a bonus for that such that it cuts it down, right? Um, but yeah, so this allows you to get out of bubbles. Only these ships can use it. Ah. One last thing about interdiction nullification. Sh shuttles have... Uh, all shuttles have full interdiction nullification. Shuttles cannot be caught by bubbles. We have entosis links. Entosis links are used for, high, uh, for null security space. This is how they fight over territory. These basically allow them to interact with the territorial beacons that um, allow them to kind of win the sites in order to uh, win the overall con you know, soft conflict. And that's how territory is fought over in Noltec. There are some limited uses of Entosis links in, in other places, but they're a little more than Easter eggs. For instance, you can Entosis link uh, Jovian observatories or uh, the Project Discovery Phase 1 monument, just as an example. Probe launchers. Probe launchers allow you to scan down signatures and ships. The core probe launchers allow you to launch core probes. This allows you to scan signatures. The expanded probe launchers allow you to fit uh, ex uh, combat probes, which allows you to scan down uh, ships. So with combat probes, you can warp, uh, you can scan down sh ships in space. You can actually get a ship that's in there safe. Obviously, the bigger the ship it is, the easier it is to scan them down. This also allows you to scan other deployables like uh, mobile tracking units, mobile depots, it, um, uh, combat filament or like uh, abyssal filaments, whatever. Uh, whereas core probes pretty much only allow you to scan down signatures. That's a whole nother topic. If you want to learn more about s scanning, you can open up the agency, go to the help section, and check out the explorer section and the scanning section for more information or the EVE Academy guide on that subject. Way out of the, uh, the scope of today. There's also survey probe launchers, but that's... Those are used to survey moons, also outside of this topic. Drone link augmenters increase the range of where, how far away your drones can go. Um, this basically drones have you, the target of your command has to be within a, uh, within your range of your drone control for your drones to be able to listen to your command. This allows you to uh, use your drones on sh things that are further away. And uh, festival launchers allow you to fire fireworks. Most important one. That is, I believe, all of the utility eyes. So that's pretty much high slots. Okay. We got high slots done in two hours. Awesome. Sure, we'll get done with the rest in less than an hour. Let's move on to mid slots. Mid slots contain electronic warfare, propulsion, and shield tank. Okay. 
we're going to start with the shield tank. Shields, as we mentioned before, uh, are very bursty. They have high repair amount. They have, uh, they front load their repairs. So the repairs happen in the beginning of the cycle instead of the end. However, they aren't very capacitor um, friendly. And generally speaking, you only want to fit one shield, uh, shield booster at a time unless you're using an ancillary because an ancillary makes it so that it, you know, you don't consume the capacitor for it. There are definitely builds that use double ancillary. So that way you can alternate between the two while they're loading. We're not talking about that right now. Uh, the standard shield booster will repair your hit, your shield hit points by a certain amount every cycle, but that can be boosted by a second, a mid slot module. Now this is not something that armor has, right? So this shield boost amplifier, its job is to amplify the shield boost. So <laughs> it's in the name, right? So if you see 101 hit points every three seconds with the amplifier on, it's 141 hit points per three seconds, right? So this shield boost amplifier is actually boosting. Yes, armor rigs do the same thing or do a similar thing, but uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, this is boosting how much this shield reps. So rather than having two shield repairers, you'll more likely than not have a shield booster boosting a shield, a, one, a single shield repper. It is also very common for people to oversize their shield booster. So while this medium shield booster is designed for cruisers, often you might see a, a cruiser with a large or even an uh, extra large shield uh, booster on it in order to make even bigger bursts of hit points for even larger amounts of capacitor. Which also means, in general, while a lot of people are kind of focused on becoming cap-stable, which means that your capacitor recharges as fast as it, you consume it, and therefore you will never run out of capacitor given no outside interference, even if you're running all your modules, often a shield-fit ship will not be cap-stable because it is uh, it is assumed that you're not always running your shield repper. Your shield repper does these big bites. And so if you're running your shield repper all the time, you're going to over rep. Therefore, it is very common in shields that you have setups that are designed to turn on and off the shields. Yes, I realize that omens don't fit shields. I'm just using this. I've been switching things out as I go. Whatever, whatever, whatever use works as a good example. Uh, I just switched the omen earlier. Uh, now, it was brought up earlier that there's a such thing as a passive shield tank. And we will talk about that now. Capacitor and shield have a baseline recharge rate, right? They recharge over time. The As you can see here, this right here says that I have 2,000 gigajoules and it recharges in 423 seconds. Given the amount that I use by running this shield recha recharger, I will, on average, lose 6.2 gigajoules per second, which means, in the long run, I will run out of capacitor. If I don't have that running, then I have 11 gigajoules above my uh, how much I'm consuming, and therefore I am totally cap stable at 100. Shields and are uh, and uh, capacitor have a similar recharge rate, with the peak recharge rate being about two and a half times its lowest recharge rate, and the peak recharge rate, as Fonsui is pointing out is basically between 25 and 30 percent right so at somewhere around 25 percent you will be get, uh 25 percent shields you'll be regenerating the most amount of shields per second that you possibly can and at 25 percent 
capacitor. You'll be recharging twenty, uh, you know, more capa the most amount of capacitor per second that you can. However, for those of you, uh, the more aware of you, those of you who've been paying attention, might notice that twenty five percent is not in the middle, and zero percent recharges at the same rate as a hundred percent. So what you see is you have this peak and then you have fall off in both directions. Fonsui's brought up a, a good image. In fact, let me see if I can pull that up. So you can see here that this arc shows capacitor recharge rate and it starts out low, goes up and then falls off quickly. What this means is, is that if you're at 25% capacitor or if you're at 24% capacitor, I should say, or 24% shields, you are only going to get slower. That's why it's, this is referred to as being broken, right? If your shield tank is broken, that means you're below 25%. If your capacitor is broken, then you're below 25% capacitor. Because whatever is bringing your capacitor down, it's only going to get worse from here. It also means that the longer you can keep your shields and, and capacitor somewhere closer to this level, the more efficient you're going to be. The reason why... Uh, the reason why you don't necessarily want shield bursts to be running all the time is because you really want to leverage this fact, right? You want to keep your capacitor and your shields pretty balanced and lower than a hundred percent, but higher than 25%, right? And you kind of juggle those two. That's how shield tanking works, or at least on that level. Now, the other interesting thing about recharge is as you notice here, it says 2,000 gigajoules in 423 seconds. If I switch over to shields, it shows four hit points per second, but it shows 1,500 hit points in 937 seconds. What does that mean? What that means is I have 1,500 hit points, and I will go from zero hit points to one to 1500 hit points 100% of my hit points in 937 seconds so if somebody wipes out my shields completely it'll take 937 seconds for my shields to naturally recharge to 100% here's the fun thing about that these two numbers are independent of each other most people would think that if you increase your shield hit points, you're also going to increase the amount of time it takes to regenerate it. But that's not how this works. Let me show you. If I take off these shield bursters and I go to the other shield modules, extenders, we'll see a very different story. Now extenders, extenders just add a raw amount of hit points to your shield. They don't, they don't activate they're not boosting up your hit points. They just straight up give you hit points, right? So you can even see, like, this is going to increase my hit points from 9,900 to, one, to 11,800. It doesn't do anything to my resistances. It doesn't do anything to that. But look, wait a minute. It also increases my hit points per second. Why is that? Well, if you look here, this 937 seconds has not changed. And yet, when I hover over this, I now go from 2,875 hit points every 937 seconds to 4,250 hit points every 937 seconds. Which means the more hit points you have in shields, the faster the shields regenerate. This is also true about capacitor. It also means that if, uh, likewise, if I go with a shield recharger, a shield recharger reduces 
the amount of time it takes. Why doesn't this turn the, the numbers green? This is weird. Uh, a shield recharger reduces the time it takes to recharge your shields. So it goes from 300 or 937 seconds to 796 seconds. Therefore, it also increases your hit points per second. What does this mean in practice? What this means in practice is that A, shields can have what's called a passive build, which utilizes its passive recharge in order to keep itself alive. If you push up your shield amount and reduce your shield recharge rate enough, you can actually have enough passive recharge that you can counteract incoming damage. Now, obviously, the Omen isn't going to do this, but there are a few ships that absolutely can. Uh, likewise, if you have a, a different module, like uh, a shield hardener that takes amount of resources, you'll see that it reduces my cap stability. It, it, tell, it reduces, or it lowers to the point of my capacitor in which I hit cap stability, but I'm still cap stable. I'll just hit cap stability at 88% because by that point, my regen has amplified up enough that it counteracts the consumption of this module. Okay? So, shields. You can extend them with shield extenders or you can speed them up with, uh, with sh speed up their recharge with shield rechargers or you can just give yourself back hit points with shield boosters so those are the three ways of kind of keeping up your hit points but you also want to prevent your hit points from going away right and that's when hardeners come in there are uh there are typed hardeners and there is the multi-spectrum hardener okay so there is shield types Sorry, the type hardeners are EM, uh, EM explosive kinetic thermal, just like we would expect. The multi-spectrum, multi-spectrum means it does all of them. So the multi-spectrum is going to do less, but it's going to do all of the types. So multi-spectrum tech 2 is 26% to each of them. Whereas an explosive hardener is going to do 44%, but only to explosive. So if you get a type hardener, you get a big boost to one type of resistance. If you do multi-spectrum, then you get all of the resistance types, but a much smaller amount. All right? Uh, the other thing to consider here is a thing called diminishing returns. Basically, subsequent modules that affect the same statistic have diminishing abilities to, uh, to affect that statistic. So while the first module will get 44%, uh, let me see if I can find that real quick. Uh, stacking. I, I need to look up the exact numbers. So uh, the first mod has 100% effectiveness. The second mod has 87% effectiveness. The third mod has 57% effectiveness. The fourth is 28%. The fifth is 10%. The sixth is 3%. Um, so what that means is, is that as you stack your third and fourth module in particular, you're getting increasingly small gains for that slot consumption. So often bonusing different things of the same in the same realm can be useful, right? Like, more hardening may not necessarily be the way to go. You might need more hit points now in order to get the, the higher amount of EHP. Interestingly enough, things like shield extenders do not have diminishing returns because they give you a flat amount, right? So uh, that's a little fun. In addition to that, this is kind of a more advanced concept, but as resistances get higher, the the value of further increases go up. So, for instance, if you're taking 50%, if you have a 50% resistance profile, and you take 100 damage, 
you're going to take 50. If you have 75% resistances, you'll take 25. This is really simple, right? However, you've gone 25% in resistances from 50 to 75. But the amount of damage that you've taken has halved. You've gone from 50 to 25. Now let's amp that up all the way up to the top, okay? Let's say you have 90% resistances. You take 100 damage, you actually take 10 damage. Now you have 91% resistances. Instead of taking that 100 damage, you now take 9 damage. 9 damage is 90% of 100, or of 10 rather, which means a 1% increase in a resistance from 90 to 91 represents a 10% reduction in, in, in incoming damage from the amount of damage that you take when you have 90% resistances to the amount of damage that you take when you have 91% resistances. So resistances get better the higher you go. However, with diminishing returns, they also get harder to get that higher resistances. All right? Something to think about. Uh, now, there are two different kinds of hardeners, two different kinds of things that increase resistances. There are shield hardeners and shield resistance amplifiers. The difference between the two is that shield uh, hardeners consume capacitor, therefore require activation, whereas shield amplifiers are passive and therefore do not require cycling, do not require capacitor, and therefore cannot be shut off by nuding. It also means that they cannot be overheated for additional value in the middle of a fight where sh hardeners can. They also have a significantly different amount. So a shield amplifier does 30%, where a shield hardener will do 44%. All right? Shield, there is a set of skills called shield compensation skills, which are kind of confusing to people. Let's look at them for a second. EM shield compensation, 5% bonus to EM resistance per level. Wait, am I dumb? Oh, for shield amplifiers. Um, so the reason why this is important is this only affects the passive version of these modules. Okay, so this skill will increase these passive modules. But if you use an active hardener, this skill does nothing for you. So just keep that in mind. A lot of people train composition, uh, comp compensation skills when they use predominantly active rep, uh, hardeners. And, uh, shield comp and the composition skills do not help again with active hardeners. Another thing that's different between armor and shields is the penalty. In general, shields increase your signature radius, which make you easier to hit, where armor increases your mass, making you slower and harder and, and more clunky. So you can see my, shield, my signature radius goes from 115 to 122 by having an extender. Now, not everything does that. Hardeners, for example, do not. A shield hardener does not increase my, my resist, uh, my, uh, my, uh, Signature radius. I think that might be it for shields. Whew. All right. Let's look at engineering equipment, which is the other thing. Capacitor batteries, capacitor rechargers, and capacitor boosters. These are three ways of um, extending or like helping your capacitor. A capacitor recharger will reduce the recharge time. So this goes from 423 seconds to 339 seconds. Remember, this is the same amount 
I'm still repairing, two, I'm still recovering 2,000 gigajoules. I'm just now recovering that 2,000 gigajoules in 340, uh, 339 seconds instead of in 423 seconds. So the cap recharger is the shield, uh, shield recharger of the capacitor. Meanwhile, the cap battery is the shield extender, as it were, right? It, it just gives you a raw amount of capacitor. So as you can see in the numbers, it increases my amount from 2000 to 2187, but it doesn't reduce my speed. So it recharges the same in the same time, but now it recharges more in that same time. So this not only increases the amount of cap that I have available, but also increases the capacitor gain that I have. Capacitor batteries, however, have a third use, which is that a capacitor battery also contains a natural energy resistance modifier. This is a big one. You remember those energy neutralizers and energy NOSs that we talked about? This will reduce the effectiveness of those neutralizations. So a single cap battery two will reduce it by 25%. This also goes up by diminishing returns, by the way. So having multiple of these does not give you 25%. It'll be closer to like 30 to 35 or uh, yeah, 30 to 35%. Um, shoot. I had something else I wanted to say about diminishing. There's something else I've missed now twice, but I, I hopefully I'll get back to it. Um, I thought it was about diminishing returns, but either way. So this will, oh, right. When it comes to diminishing returns, the way it works is this. Some people might ask, well, how do you know what gets diminished, right? If I get, if I have a, uh, if I have a cap battery two and a cap battery one, what is my answer? And the answer is, is that it gets all of the different modules, all of the different things that impact that stat and it arranges them from biggest bonus to smallest bonus. So the biggest bonus gets the gets the full effect, and then the stacking or the stacking penalties get applied to the rest of the bonuses in order of strongest to weakest bonus. Okay, which actually means that if you have two or three of a module type, and they're like really fancy and nice. That last one that you put on, if you put on like a third or a fourth module of the same type, your diminishing returns are so great that it almost doesn't matter that it's a weaker one because it's the one that's going to get highly diminished. And so you get a small percentage of a slightly less amount. Finally, we have capacitor boosters. Capacitor boosters are like shield boosters, but... Unlike shield boosters, they don't take capacitor, obviously. They, but like ancillary shield booster, they take cap charges. So, as you can see, a shield booster comes with uh, a certain size, and it can be used with certain cap boosters. Navy cap boosters are smaller in size than, the, than, the, uh, than their non-Navy equivalent. And the cap booster's size is how much capacitor that it regenerates. Right, so this cap booster 400, when you hit it, will give you 400 gigajoules, which in the case of this omen would be, what, one fifth of the total uh, capacitor of the omen in a single shot. Um, likewise, the 800 gives you 800 capacitor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's why the navies are kind of cool because the navy gives you 400 capacitor for less usage. And so we'll see. Like, check this out. If I put in cap cap booster 800s. I can only fit one. This is actually a bad example. Because that's also only one. Let's go with 400s. Uh, I'll fit two of those. And three of those. Right? So, the same cap amount, but now I have more charges before I have to reload. So, this one, if I go with these, I get 1,200 capacitor. Sorry. 800 capacitor before I have to re reload. Whereas if I go to Navy, I would get 1200 capacitor before I have to reload. Uh, pretty cool. A lot of people like to run these with the largest cap booster that you can possibly stuff in it, though, um, in order to get big bursts of cap. Also, the, the it's it's more or less designed. It isn't always true, but it's more or less designed that the smaller, the 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 less effective, sorry, the less effective, the, the less 
um, enhanced. We'll talk about the different types of modules. Uh, well, the way that they restrict them is a smaller capacity, right? So a Tech 2 booster will have more total capacity than, uh, or will be able to fit more of these boosters than a, a say, a compact. But usually the Navy cap booster will compensate for that, right? Either way. In general, these are really good against newts as well. Uh, the cap battery will, of course, reduce the amount that you're being neuted, but the cap booster will allow you to get neuted and then just re-inject and get more capacitor so that way you can do stuff. On to propulsion. All right, so propulsion are also known as uh, uh, prop mods. Propulsions uh, mods are divided into afterburners and micro warp drives. Uh, both of them will make you go faster. Actually, technically, there's also micro drum drives, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, afterburner, both of them will make you go faster. Micro warp drives will make you go a lot faster, but it has its own restrictions. So let's go ahead and look at the difference between these two. Uh, 5MN <coughs> micro drawer drive 1 is the equivalent of a 1MN afterburner 1. So we're going to look. The maximum velocity of a micro warp drive is 500%, while an afterburner is only 115%. That is huge. 500% speed is huge. However, there's a few things to remember. First of all, we know about fitting. Let's look at that first and foremost. The fitting of a micro warp drive is greater than an afterburner. So it's going to take more power grade and more CPU to fit your micro warp drive over your afterburner. That's problem one. Problem two. Activation cost. A micro warp drive takes 45 gigajoules to run, where an afterburner takes 20. So a micro warp drive takes over twice as much capacitor as an afterburner. However, it gets a little bit worse because micro warp drives double dip in their in their eating away of your cap. Not only does it have a bigger activation cost, but micro warp drives have an additional penalty that reduces your overall capacitor capacity. So this micro warp drive, if I fit it, will reduce my capacitor by 25%, which remember, will also reduce its capacitor recharge rate by 25%, because you now have 25% less capacitor to recharge in the same amount of time. So this is not only taking more capacitor, but it gives you less capacitor, and and limits your capacitor recharge rate on top of that. So micro warp drive is far more punishing towards your capacitor. And finally, what is a reactivation delay? Why is there a reactivation delay? Weird. Uh, finally, and kind of most noteworthy, for the micro warp drive, there is a 500% signature radius modifier. Now, better quality versions of the micro warp drive have a better ratio in this. But, um, oh yeah, micro warp drive also has a faster cycle time than an AB, so it'll even get more cap than that. But here's the biggest thing. The micro warp drive signature radius bonus, or penalty rather, even if you consider the fact that better ones have oh, uh, a better rate for this, what this means is, is that this is increasing your signature radius... At, at almost as much or as much as it's increasing your speed. And if you remember this chart right here, an increased signature radius can actually undermine speed, right? This is true with both turrets and missiles. So while the micro warp drive makes you go faster, the, the additional difficulty in hitting you that being faster gives you is undermined by your bloom of your signature. That bloom of your signature also makes you faster to lock, by the way. So they can lock you down a lot faster as well. 
In addition to that, micro warp drives get shut off by warp scramblers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So when you're under warp scrambling, you cannot use a micro warp drive. So there's a lot of restrictions behind a micro warp drive, but it, that 500% speed is huge. So what does this mean in practice? In practice, micro warp drives are used for kiting. Afterburners are often used for brawling. Micro warp drives want to stay outside of scram range. So they want to stay outside of 10 kilometers almost always, or unless you're using the micro warp drive to get into range. Um, you're not expecting to use it basically inside of 10 kilometers because there's a good chance or that, you know, you might get scrammed. Um, but in general, micro warp drives are about repositioning. They make you go very fast. They get you from point A to point B very quickly, which is important if you want to be at point B and not at point A. Afterburners are for damage mitigation. Okay? A lot of people think of these things as the same thing, but they're not. An afterburner isn't a worse micro warp drive. Okay? It's not a compromise. A micro warp drive is about moving you from point A to point B. An afterburner is about damage mitigation. It makes you go faster, but in going faster, you also take less damage and you're harder to get affected by things. You know, you can push out of scrams, you can maybe even burn out of webs. Um, but more importantly, you're going faster without being any bigger. And as anybody knows, it's harder to hit something moving faster. And likewise, with this chart right here, going faster without making yourself bigger means that you're just going to straight up take less damage. All right? Afterburners are for mitigation. Micro warp drives are for repositioning. Anything else I need to cover about those? Almost every ship you will, you will ever see will have one of these two prop mods in them. In fact, if they don't have one of the two, then it's referred to as a propless mod. Um, okay. Or propless ship uh, fit. Okay, so in addition to that, we have micro jump drives and micro jump field generators. Micro jump drives are a special piece of equipment. Large micro jump drives can be fit onto battleships. Medium micro jump drives can be fit to, fit to battle cruisers. Um, the they both had the same effect though, which is they take a certain amount of activation time, twelve second space for this one. I think it's the same. Yeah, twelve seconds. This gets reduced by skills. After that, basically, when when you hit. Hey, thanks for that, guys. Uh, when you hit the, mi the micro jump drive, your ship starts going at maximum speed in the direction that you're pointing. Okay? And then at the time, at the end of the activation time, if you are not scrammed, then you will be teleported 100 kilometers straight forward. Okay. Um, oh yeah, they can be fit onto deep space transports and flag cruisers, which are uh, exceptions to that. All the all the rest of these are types of battle cruisers. So, in a my auto mod found Azazel to be a, a a bullying term. Wow. All right. Fair enough. Um. So. This has a couple of implications. First of all, this means that battleships and battle cruisers that have this can suddenly appear 100 kilometers further than they were. They can use this to escape and they can use this to jump onto people. Now, it's got a really long reactivation delay, so you can't use them all the time. Uh, only once every few minutes, but that ability is pretty fucking cool. If you get scrammed, then you can't use it. If you get scrammed during the middle of it, then it stops working. And if you get bumped... When the teleport happens, you teleport in 100 kilometers straight forward at the time of the jump. So if somebody bumps you, you are going whichever direction 
you are now pointing at the time of the uh, micro jump drive activation. So be careful about that. Um, the micro jump field generator, on the other hand, is basically the same concept. However, these can only be fit to command destroyers. And rather than teleporting only yourself 100 kilometers, it will teleport any subcapital within range, any anchored bubble, any bomb, and any drone that is within its radius six kilometers at the time of its active uh, at the time of the end of its spool. All of it, this six kilometer. Uh, air radius sphere will move exactly 100 kilometers in the direction that the command destroyer is pointing. Anything within that sphere that is scrammed will not move. And if the command destroyer is scrammed, the entire thing gets canceled. So command destroyers can actually not only, they can do two things. One, they can move your entire fleet in a direction, although they can only move up to 25 different ships at a time. Or a command destroyer can grab, can get near, like, like let's say you're fighting and you get near part of the enemy fleet and you activate, you can actually rip part of their fleet away from the fight as long as they don't scram you in time. This does not work on capitals, it does not work on a few other things. Pretty cool stuff. The, but it's the reason why I can consider those separate from afterburners and micro warp drives. There is also a deployable structure that you can use that does the same thing. It's called a mobile micro jump drive, um, jump unit. Next, you have all of your exploration stuff. We're going to skip over a lot of this stuff because you can look into it with the um, with exploration guides. But you've got your analyzers that let you hack into cans. You've got your cargo scanners that allow you to scan uh, ships and cans uh, for th what their contents is. You've got a scanning upgrades that lets you scan things better, like probe down things. Uh, then you've got ship scanners. Ship scanners allow you to see the enemy fit or like the targets fit and their capacitor. Note, you're not necessarily going to see their whole fit. You're going to see, you know, part of the fit based on your success rate. And then survey scanners allow you to scan like rocks and stuff to see what kind of uh, material is inside. Okay. You can also fit weapons upgrades. Now, every weapons upgrade has a mid slot and a low slot type for it. Every weapons upgrade will increase the uh, several different pieces of how a weapon works. So in this case, a tracking computer Hold on, that's a remote tracking computer. Uh, a tracking computer will increase your fall off, increase your optimal, and increase your tracking. Meanwhile, missile guidance computers will, as probably would be expected, reduces your uh sorry yeah reduces your explosion velocity no increases your explosion velocity reduces your explosion radius both of those allow you to apply better and increases your flight flight time by four percent okay uh and then of course the remote tracking computer is the same as a tracking computer but you use it on your uh ally instead of yourself now, the low slot module version of these also increases these things, but to a lesser extent. However, this is where things get kind of interesting. There are a lot of modules, especially in the mid-slot range, that affect multiple things. And as you can see, this module has room for ammunition. So what goes inside of this? What goes inside of this is what's called scripts. Okay, anytime a module like this can be used with, it does multiple different things, then you can script them to make it so that you emphasize one over the other, right? So we saw this earlier. We can see right now, this gives my explosion velocity 8.25, 8 8.25, and 5.5. Got it? If I 
close this. If I fit a, uh, this missile guy, uh, that's with the missile guidance computer. The, the, that's some uh, slightly larger numbers than we saw when without a missile guidance computer. However, if I go and get this missile precision script, you see that now my explosion velocity. Hold on. I, that right. Never mind. I have to reopen this. Now my explosion velocity is 16%. My explosion radius is 16%. I don't know why that's red. It's actually, you know, it's better, but either way. But wait a minute. Something's missing. There's no flight time bonus. Hey, thank you for the raid, Zapando. Likewise, if I go here and I get the missile range script and I put it in here, I can go and see, hey, look. Wait. Do it again. I can say, hey, look. It increases my flight time by 11%. But this time, there's no explosive or uh, explosion radius or, or explosion velocity. So what that means is that anytime you have a, a, a module that can affect multiple kinds of ability uh, stats, there will likely be a script for each of those stats that will increase the amount that it bonuses that particular stat while removing its bonus to the other stats. The other thing that's worth noting is that, as it was just asked in, in chat, Scripts do not get consumed. So in general, you just carry one script of each type for uh, for your for your stuff, and then and once again, and also scripts can swap out instantly. So you just decycle the mod to put in the script. This is one of the reasons why, I like the idea of having two modules, one scripted in each way, kind of seems odd to me. Um. Because 11% and then 5.5%, like, it literally just doubles it. So if you can take two missile guidance computers and you put one script into one and one script to the other, it's actually the same as having two unscripted ones. Just throwing that out there. All right. Once again, all of those, though, uh, for the most part, all, uh, sorry, all that stuff in the mid-slot range is all about application. There's no bonuses to damage in that, if you noticed. It's all application. Damage is how much raw damage it can do. Application is how much of that raw damage it actually gets to do. All right, next is drone upgrades. We haven't really touched drones too much yet, um, but... This allows you to have drone navigation computer, which will uh, speed up drones, and a omnidirectional tracking link, which will uh, basically give your drones better uh, application. It's the application mod for mod for your drones. Is that it for mid slots? Have I missed anything in mid slots? I'm look, man. I'm just don't even worry about the ship, okay? Like I'm just using, I'm, I'm pulling in a ship whenever I had I need an example, and I'm just throwing things on whenever I need an example. It has nothing to do with anything. Uh, okay. Whew. I probably won't cover everything today, but we're going to keep on going. We're going to go to low slots. Oh, thank you. I did. I, I missed an entire category of mid slots. Electronic warfare. Forgot the biggest category of mid slots. Actually, we might we might just finish up with mid slots and then and then do the rest of this tomorrow. Uh, okay. Let's settle in. As I mentioned earlier, each uh, empire 
has its own specialty in electronic warfare. Each empire besides the Kaldari have two different focuses. The Kaldari have one, uh, mostly because the one is uh, probably the most impactful of all of them. So let's look at them one step at a time. First and foremost, we're actually going to start with our good old friend that we talked about earlier and you kind of know about from the, uh, from the tutorial, the Stasis Webifier. The Stasis Webifier is very simple. It simply just reduces your opponent's velocity. Uh, this makes them go slower. It allows you to dictate range. As we noted earlier, when they go slower, you can move, you can hit them easier. Um, you know, stasis weapon fires are really good, except as you notice, the range is 10 kilometers. I'm going to use this opportunity to explain overheating a little bit. There's a skill called thermodynamics. Thermodynamics allows you to overheat your weapons, or overheat your modules. I'm reasonably sure every module that can be activated can also be overheated at this point. Overheating a module, uh, we're not going to get into all the details of how overheating works, but we will just simply say that overheating a module is a, an attempt to get more effectiveness out of it at the risk of damaging it and the other modules in the same rack as them. Okay? Uh... So, in other words, a overheated mid-slot module can do heat damage to itself and to the modules next to it. Now, that heat damage is uh, different than physical damage, than your actual ship damage. And we'll do, the, we'll do an example. Here's a micro warp drive. I can activate my micro warp drive. I'm now going really fast. According to this micro warp drive, I now go 2879 meters per second. That's really fast. Overheating a micro warp drive makes you go faster. Trim. So if I overheat this micro warp drive, boom, I'm now going 4,124 meters per second. Holy shit, that is so fucking fast. But you can notice two things. One, there's a red bar coming up here. And as it cycles, you're going to start to see a red bar appear around some of these modules too. Look, that red... So this is starting to fill up. This is showing how much heat is building up into my mid-slots. And look, this module now has red around it, and this module has red around it. So this module is actually doing damage to this module as it's going. Each cycle, it's checking to see whether or not it does damage to itself or to its neighbors. And as it does so, boom, look, another hit to both of them. Now they are uh, two-thirds of the way damaged. Actually, this one's 71% damaged. Okay, now this doesn't, again, this doesn't affect my hit points at all. Boom! Burned out. I just burned out all my mid slots. They took full damage. Ring, ring of fire all the way around. They are now shut off. These modules are completely off until I can dock up, repair them, or until I can get them fully repaired and then online them again, usually by docking up. So you can get more effectiveness out of them but you risk burning them out and the ones near them, okay? The, the worst uh, are, are, you know, different things burn out faster or slower. Turrets are, like, weapons are notorious because there's so many of them. Uh, you can repair this damage with repair paste, but not if they're fully burned out. Okay. Why did I bring this up right now? Remember how I told you that the range of the web of fire is, is very short? Well, overheating a module makes it better. But what better means is different for each module. In the case of the micro warp drive, it made me go faster, because that's what micro warp drives do. In the case of a web, though, it actually makes my web go further. So now my web goes 13 kilometers instead of 10. So... I would overheat that, get my web on them, slow them down, catch up, and then stop the overheat in order to be able to keep it that way. Yes, this is going on YouTube. Likewise, there are other things that we'll look at that also have a range bonus in, in overheating. So remembering what modules get, do what when they overheat is a fa really useful. Weapon systems most of the time cycle faster. Triglavian weapon systems do more damage instead of cycling faster because you don't want them to ramp faster. Um, E-War often will be more of, 
uh, effective in range, but not always, as we'll see. Um, and like reppers and stuff, like defensive modules, resistances will resistance modules will increase the amount of resistances that it provides, and boosters will speed them up. Now, the funny thing about speeding things up with overheating is uh, that if you think about it, the faster you're cycling, the faster you'll burn too, because each cycle is a chance for it to overheat again. And as you can see, also as, over time, my heat in my mid slots do go down, but like I can overheat, get a little bit of heat and then stop overheating and then overheat again. And I'll actually have a higher chance of over of doing heat damage because I'll still have heat built up uh, in, in my mid slots. Okay. Let's move on. Next is target painters. Target painters increase. Uh, let's not do it on the ship. Target painters increase your uh, the signature radius of your opponent. So, for instance, this target painter, the basic target painter, increases your opponent's effective signature radius by twenty five percent. As we learned, signature radius is your effective size. So, the larger the signature radius, the more missiles will apply, and the better turrets will hit. Okay. So a target painter will increase the application of everyone who is firing at that particular target. Um, here you have an optimal range and a fall off. When it comes to E-War, the effectiveness fall off just means that like it gets to 50% effectiveness at that range. So, uh, you know, here we have a 30% a 30 kilometer optimal range and a 105 per, uh, kilometer uh, fall off range. I believe that's how it works, right? That's how it works with weapons. Yeah, 147. Well, because it's bonus. Uh, so. Target painters and web of fires. Target painters make them bigger, make them easier to hit. Also, you know, obviously undermines people trying to sig tank. You know, with sig tank means using a very small signature, making you hard to hit. Um, well, the web of fire slows them down. These two weapon systems or E-War systems are the Mimitar E-War systems. The Galente E-War systems begin with remote sensor dampeners. Remote sensor dampeners are the same are the opposite of uh, sensor boosters, which we haven't actually gotten to yet. So the scan resolution is how fast you can lock things. And of course, maximum targeting range is maximum targeting range. So this will reduce their targeting range and reduce or increase the amount of time it takes for them to lock any given ship. All right. While the target painter has only one thing it does, it blooms their signature. The sensor dampener has two things that it affects and therefore it is scripted. See? So I can now script for targeting range or scan resolution, depending on which one of those I want to nerf, or I can keep it unscripted and and take them down evenly. Um, overheating them uh, increases its effectiveness. 22% versus 18%. Likewise, with target painter, 30% versus 36%. So these are effectiveness, not range. You can tell because they already have a, a very long range, right? These guys, these guys have very long range, 42 to 147, 42 to 126. A range bonus for overheating doesn't do anything. So these are effective bonus, effectiveness bonuses. For, whereas the web of fire is a very short range, 10 kilometers. Therefore, overheating it extends the range. Uh, and then on the, the other um, Galente ability, is the disruptors warp disruption as we've mentioned earlier there's two there's warp disruptors and there's warp scramblers warp disruptors and warp scramblers oops so first and foremost the warp disruptor Warp disruptors disrupt at 20 kilometers by default. 
And a war scrambler scrambles at seven and a half kilometers by default. That's a huge difference. So, uh, obviously, if you want to be able to hold on to somebody, you're going to want to use a warp disruptor, right? Well, there's a couple of extra bonuses. First of all, uh, it is also the warp disruptor is going to cost a lot more in capacitor. So, a warp scrambler is going to be make you less warp uh, cap, say, uh, or you know, will help or hurt your cap stability less. A scrambler takes less fitting. So it's easier to fit a scram than a, than a disruptor. But most importantly, I think, a warp disruptor or a warp scrambler will turn off... Sorry, there's another note, which is your uh, warp scramble strength. A warp scrambler is worth two or more warp scramble strength, depending on which warp scrambler it is. Whereas a warp disruptor is only ever worth one. Uh, the third one, the, or the last thing, which I, is that a warp scrambler, any warp scrambler at all, will shut off any micro warp drives or micro jump drives on your opponent's ship, right? So if you scram somebody, you can, and they they rely on a micro warp drive to move around. They ain't moving anymore. This is why I was saying earlier that afterburners tend to like to fight short, shorter range where they expect to be scrammed. Whereas a micro warp drive might want to stay further away to avoid being scrammed. A, a, a micro warp drive pilot, a kiter, which would be a kiter, um, would use a twenty this twenty kilometer warp disruptor to stay far away and be able to peg them at range. Whereas a more brawly ship might use a warp scrambler and a web to lock down the target to get on top of them. This warp scramble strength is based on your ship's warp core stability. Your ship by default has one point of warp core stability. There are some ships that have bonuses to warp core stability, and there's a low slot module that increases your warp core stability, but only by a certain amount, but only by two. By natural amounts, you have one warp core stability. So either of these will reduce your warp core stability to zero, and you won't be able to warp. However, if you have one of those ones that have a bonus to warp core stability, or you have an active warp core stabi stabilizer, you would be able to warp even if they have a warp disruptor on you. But if you have enough points via your scrambler or whatever, or maybe multiple people are using warp disruptors on a single target, you can still lock them down, right? If they have three points of warp stability, for example, and you have a warp disruptor and a scrambler on them, maybe two different people, then that ship is not going to warp until they can slough off one of the two. Okay? So this is how you keep people on field. And this is also the reason why you see profiles and setups that are, you know, brawly ships, you see more target, or you see more, like, webs and afterburners and scrams, because those all kind of synergize with each other. They're all designed to be used in close quarters. Also, newts and other stuff like that. Um, whereas disruptors you know micro you, you see micro warp drives target painters missiles and other stuff like that that are designed to fight at range working together uh thanks to the warp disruptors this is also why those mortis legion ships are so powerful because if i can scram you at 15 kilometers and you can't scram me now i can kite you at 14 kilometers with a micro warp drive Ensuring that you don't have a micro warp drive, and I do. That is very strong. Or I can shoot, I can fight at like 25 kilometers well outside of your warp disruption range and still keep you warp disrupted, and therefore I can bug out anytime I want to, but you can't. All right, next. Let's finish this up. We'll, we'll talk... Ah, shoot. We'll talk uh, rigs and such tomorrow. We'll, we'll do an addendum tomorrow. Well, no, I, I have time. Fuck it. Let's keep going. Uh, next is the... So that's uh, Galente. Next is Amar. Amar, we've already been introduced to one of the electronic warfare. 
because new energy neutralization is considered to be one of the two Amar energy uh, uh, electronic warfare, with the other being weapon disruption. Weapon disruption can be either guidance disruption or tracking disruption. Guidance disrup disruption, of course, does missiles. Tracking disruption does tracking. They're exactly the same as a guidance uh, a guidance computer and a tracking computer, but exactly the opposite. They are also scripted. They also can do, they do both application and range, and they have a script each for both of them. Okay, so we can actually just kind of skip over that. But that leaves ECM. ECM, uh, so each race has a different kind of sensor, right? So the Amar have radar, I don't even remember. Oh, well, yeah, the Kaldari have gravimetric, the Amar have radar, the uh, Galente have magnometric, and the uh, the Mimitar have radar. Wait, yeah, Amar have radar, Mimitar have radar. I don't know if I said that right the first time. The way I know that without actually looking them all up is by looking at these modules. The key here is the color. While each race has a damage type, each race also has a color. In this case, the Kaldari is blue. The Mimitar is red. The Galente is like teal. And the Amar is yellow. Now, if you use the correct jammer on the correct type of ship, you have a, you have a much higher chance of actually doing uh, a, an effective cycle than if you use it, use the wrong type. Like, so here I have 3.3 jamming strength for against Amar, but only 1.1 against all the rest. Likewise, this one will give me 3.3 against Kaldari and 1.1 against the rest. So if I'm three times more effective against the correct type than against the other type. There is a multi spectrum that kind of hedges the middle of it, right? So now you got 2.2 for everyone. Not the best. But at least it works for everybody. You don't need to already know what kind of ship you're going to be jamming. What does this, why, why does this matter? Uh, so you have a sensor strength. And it has a jamming strength. Based on the relationship of those two words, of th those two numbers, each cycle, it rolls a random chance. And if the jammer beats the sensor defenses of the ship, then the jam is successful. And if it's not higher, then it fails. You can actually tell in the overview, or when you have a ship locked or whatever, or if you're being affected by it, because it'll be, um, it'll be grayed out if you failed. And it'll, or if it was failed, if it, if the jam failed and it'll be lit up if it was successful. The question was, if you can use them in PVE, yes, you can against the newer rats, like newer bad guys that came uh, within the last three or four years, you can use E-War on them. Uh, interestingly enough, so the way ECM works is that when a jam is successful, that ship can no longer lock anything except the ship jamming it. Okay? So, if I get a successful jam onto you, it doesn't matter how many friends I bring with me, I am the only ship that you can lock. If me and my friend jam you, you can choose which one of those two you wish to jam. Now, you can jam things like the invasion rats or event rats, but interestingly enough, their AI, as of this recording, doesn't know that it can j lock you back and therefore won't. Jamming a rat will just cause them to be dead in the water until the jam's done. This is why this is so effective at breaking locks or break, uh, you know, breaking. How long does the jamming last? Uh, a jamming cycle is. 20 seconds. Now, 
This is why this is so effective against those logi chains that we mentioned earlier. You can't cap out the logi chains because the, they'll, just, they'll just have incoming capacitor that uh, will replace the capacitor that you ate. But this, if you can jam them, then you'll break the chain. And each of those ships are expecting capacitor to come in to help them. So if you can jam a couple of the logi ships, not only are you reducing the amount of they can rep because they can no longer target each other or the allies, they can only target the enemy that's jamming them, which is not very useful to a logi ship. Therefore, you can disrupt the entire chain just by starting to jam them. You can sensor damp them too, but a lot of uh, uh, logi chains will stick, stick close together and therefore it won't be as effective. You can damp them to make it so that they're slower to lock each other. And damps and jams obviously work out really, really well together because if you damp them, then it takes them a long time to, to, to relock. And if you jam them, you break the lock. So each time you jam them, it takes them even longer to recover, right? So, um, but if the jam is unsuccessful, nothing happens at all. So it either is 100% effective and the only person you can lock is the person who's jamming you, or it's 100% ineffective and you can lock whoever you want. The cav the it was mentioned earlier, uh, ECM drones. Now, we'll talk more about drones another time, uh, but I do want to specifically talk about ECM drones in this instance. Because while a lot of E-War uh, e uh, e drones are not great for various reasons, ECM drones are uniquely valuable. Because, see, here's the thing. We said that when you are jammed, the only thing that you're allowed to lock is is the thing jamming you. So if I jam you with my jammer, you can lock me. But if I jam you with my drones, you can only lock the drone that jammed you. This is why explorers in particular carry a flight of jamming drones with them instead of combat drones. It, now, the jam strength of, of jamming drones is relatively low. Your chances of actually succeeding are low. But if it works, it is the difference between uh, living and dying. Your, the drone can get the successful jam. It breaks the lock on you. They can't be scramming you. They can't be webbing you. They can't be doing any of that stuff because they don't have you locked. And you just leave. Thank you, drone, for your service. Yes, if you have all five uh, jamming drones, all five of them get a roll. Therefore, you have five small chances to be successful, which equates to one moderate uh, chance. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the last thing I... Uh, there's two specialty items that need to be talked about when it comes to battleships in particular. You have the stasis grapplers and the signal suppressors. The stasis grapplers are basically like super webs that um, they're, they're kind of confusing, though, because of the way it works. Their optimal range is 1000, but their fall off is 10 kilometers and they can affect up to twice their fall off range. So what this means is or, or three times, no, three times the fall off range, I think, which means that you can use these grapplers up like. 20 kilometers or more away, but they won't do very much good. But the closer you are, the more that the grappler will affect you to the point where uh, the optimal range, if you're at your optimal, 100, if you're they're one kilometer away from you, you're actually going to be disrupting them by 85% versus the, uh, the webifier. We're going to compare it to a T2 webifier just so it's even. A webifier, a T2 webifier is 60%. 60% versus 80%. Uh, oh yeah, EM, ECM burst is a little bit different. ECM burst basically tries to jam everybody around you. And uh, I think isn't this the one 
that is based on how many things are locking you. Either way, this just attempts to break the locks of everybody around you. No, this isn't the lock breaker. I actually don't... I get this confused with the other one, which is actually now the signal suppressor. Okay. Whatever. So this attempts to jam everybody around you. The target breaker doesn't exist anymore. Uh, this is also potentially very useful for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, if a lot of things are targeting you, then... You know, you might need to burst them, but also, again, with, like, the the exploration frigate, you don't necessarily want to have to lock your target to be able to jam them, so you just pop this in order to jam them. But, unfortunately, because of the way the jams... Does this allow lock back? Now that I think about it? Either way. The target... W w maybe we'll look back. Okay, so this doesn't allow lock back. So, yeah, this is just a really good uh, uh, jammer, but it's not that effective this may look effective but this is this looks effective because burst jammers are not impacted by the same skills and ship bonuses that normal ecm is so while ecm will be magnified way above in sensor strength these pretty much stay at where they are uh okay Back to the battleship only things. So as I just mentioned, uh, so the grappler is a super web that, that gets more effective as you get closer. And the other one is the signal suppre signature suppressor. The signature suppressor is uh, actually replaced the target breaker. Um, oh yeah, it has to be a battleship. Herp, herp, herp. So uh, what a signature to suppressor does is it actually just reduces the signature radius of the battleship um this does a couple of things one it makes it harder to hit uh even even if it's just passively on it it reduces your signature radius by a certain amount but then it reduces your signature by a big amount while it's activated um now it can only be activated once every uh 150 seconds unbonused so it can't be running all the time, and it only lasts for 12 seconds, so it certainly doesn't run all the time. But during that window of opportunity, you are very small compared to other battleships. Interestingly enough, the signature radius suppressor, or the uh, uh, signature radius suppressor, even its passive bonus, the smaller your signature radius, the harder you are to scan down. And your sensor strength, there's a little known benefit of sensor strength. It actually specifically says larger values reduces the chance of being jammed by ECM and assists in avoiding detection by probes. This is the part that a lot of people don't get. And this is why there used to be unprobable ships because your signature radius, sorry, your sensor strength functions as a direct subtraction to your effective signature radius as far as probing you down goes okay so if for some reason your signature your sensor strength was greater than your signature radius you would literally be unprobable now that isn't possible anymore but it used to be possible and that's why so uh you know especially with uh you know like there are certain battleships like the marauder that also gets really big bonuses to its sensor to its sensor strength this reduction to its signature radius makes it so that the, they are very hard to scan down compared to other battleships. That's your mid slots. If your sig radius divided by sensor strength was below one, you're unprobable. I thought it was a direct subtraction. Either way, whatever. It it has a an effectiveness against it. I don't remember the exact math. All right, low slots. Ah, let's go. We'll see if we run out of time. I was wanting to cover meta modules and like different stuff like that. That might be tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll try to get like all of the mods types and slots and everything today. And then tomorrow we'll talk about like faction and dead space and meta and all that kind of stuff. All right, so in the low slots, low slots are generally speaking the domain of armor, uh, armor tanks, 
damage increase and to a lesser extent, like stat bonuses. Okay. So let's start with one of the most popular um, low slot modules, the damage control. The damage control, you can fit one damage control on each ship. It is, uh, well, agility is a stat. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, a whole, so a damage control is where there aren't any shield, sorry, while there are no mid slots that enhance shield tanks, there actually is a low slot that helps with, uh, with shields, which would be the damage control. Also, the damage control is on a different diminishing returns than most other, uh, resistance bonuses. Therefore, uh, especially when you're getting up to stacking penalties when it comes to your resistance modules, the damage control can come along and be more effective. What mid-slot module affects mount, uh, armor tank? All there is is hull repairers. Whereas the, she the, the uh, damage control increases the resistances of shields. As well as armor. Oh! My bad. There are no mid-slot modules that enhance armor tanks. There are There is one low-slot module that enhance... Well, actually, there's several low-slot modules that enhance shield tanks. This one is the one that enhances the resistances. The other big one is this 30% hull resistance. Um, this is where hull tanking comes in. This is actually a pretty big resistance uh, to your hull, especially given the fact that you've already got 33% natural resistances. So a single damage control increases your hull resistances by quite a bit, uh, up to a very reasonable amount just by one module. Uh, however, only certain ship, just like a passive regeneration of your shields for a passive ship, so too, not a lot of ships can get away with utilizing this resistances to hull, but some can. All right. Uh, so the damage control is uh, it's just generally really good. There's an advanced version of that called the assault damage control that can be used by only assault frigates and heavy assault frigates that has a slightly lower natural resistance than the, um, than the normal damage control. However, these can be activated. The damage control is a passive. This is an active module. When you activate, when it's passive, it gives you these. When it's active, it increases these resistances by 75%. So this thing spikes your resistances to like over 90% in everything for like 8 to 10 seconds. So assault frigates and assault cruisers that utilize assault damage controls can become basically extremely difficult to kill or unkillable. Meh. Extremely difficult to kill for a short period of time. Um... This is actually really good because, you know, especially since a lot of people are not prone to swap targets very quickly. So if you just waste your time trying to burn through an assault, uh, something with an assault damage control running, then uh, they'll just live while you don't. All right, next. Going on to armor, in the same sort of way that there are shields, there are things that increase your armor by raw amounts. There are things that uh, give you back armor, and there are things that increase your armor's resistances. However, because of the fact that there is no passive armor regeneration, there's a few more options when it comes to resistances. So let's look at that. First of all, there's armor plates. Armor plates are just like shield extenders. They, <clears throat> they increase your raw hit points. Okay, so I can go here. And this 400 steel plate increases my hit points by 900. If I go and get the twice as big steel plate, the 800 steel plate, 1750. 900, 1750. So basically twice as much. Uh, 
Now, while shields will increase your signature radius, they and therefore make you easier to target and hit, plates will reduce will increase your mass, making you slower and clunkier. All right. So as you can see, if I uh, if I hover over this thing, you can see my hit points go up, but my navigation goes down. My align time gets worse, and my my speed doesn't actually go down, but how fast I get to speed does. All right. Armor repairs are much like at cost of higher initiative. Less agility. Yes, less agility. Thank you. Which is agility affects how fast you can uh, change your speed or vector. Armor repairs are uh, basically the armor equivalent of shield repairs. As we mentioned earlier, armor repairs function at the end of the cycle, where shield repairs function at the beginning of the cycle. Also, armor repairs... Uh, shoot, hold on. Uh, compare. Shield. Boost. Small armor repper one, small shield booster one. So as we see here, the armor repairer costs twice as much. Wow, I'm making myself sound stupid, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I, I actually get vindicated in the end. Um, so Activation cost is 40 gigajoules versus 20 gigajoules. However, the small armor repairer cycles every six seconds. So every six seconds, it goes through 40 gigajoules, whereas the shield booster go, every two seconds does 20 gigajoules. So every six seconds, a small shield booster will do 60 gigajoules. So in the end, the small shield booster actually consumes more power or more capacitor. Okay, we we we, we with that so far? Good. The shield booster also takes significantly higher CPU usage, but significantly lower power grid usage. Now, the other piece is, is that the shield bonus is only 20, is 26 hit points, where the armor bonus is 69 hit points. Nice. Uh, the other piece to this is that, remember, cycles three times as fast, three times 26, 60, 78. So this will rep 78 shield in 60 gigajoules, whereas this will rep 69 hit points, nice, with 40 gigajoules. See what I mean earlier? So bigger, bigger reps for shields, more efficient reps for armor, or at least lower capacitor reps. So while the shields will have multiple shield boosters as a way of like, sorry, while the shield... While shields will have oversized shield boosters and shield boost amplifiers as a way of increasing the amount that you can repair, uh, the armor reppers generally don't do that. It's hard to over, uh, you know, put in a, a oversized armor repper, and it honestly isn't as as good as 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 extra shield boosters so sorry ah uh, uh my bad so there is no armor ampli re repairing amplification so rather than having multi uh, an armor repper with an armor rep amplifier you would actually have multiple armor reppers and have a second armor repper that may or may not always run even better, you can have that extra be a small ancillary, or sorry, you can have that extra one be an ancillary armor repper. Therefore, you have your standard rep, this is what you expect to live off of, and then your burst rep in your ancil for when things get crazy. Uh, and of course, you can always overheat both of these as well. Overheating makes them cycle faster, which makes them work, uh, you know, give you better or give you more over time. Uh... 
Now, like I said, it, with shield boosters, you wouldn't necessarily go with multiple mods. With armor reps, you would not necessarily overdo it. Because let's try to overprop or over rep. That's well, but it's still not that much, right? So if I go here, armor repper 30 versus 30. So two smaller, a small armor repper with a lot less consumption, I think. Why do we only use one? No, uh, but yeah, you would use, you would use multiple armor reppers, uh, and an insel armor repper to get extra reps when you would use a bigger shield booster to get shields. The ancillary shield uh, booster even amplifies this by the fact that it doesn't take cap. Okay. Next is hardeners and hardeners get a little bit complicated. There is armor resistance coatings. Layered armor coatings, layered energized armor membranes, energized armor resistance membranes, and armor hardeners. What's the difference? It's complicated. Let's find out. Let's look at a tech one version of each of them. Here's an EM armor hardener. Here's an EM coating. Layered armor coating. Wait. That's actually totally different. Oh! Layered armor coating increases a, a percentage of hit points. Holy crap, like nobody ever uses this thing. All right, well, the layer coating increases your uh, your hit points by a percent, where plates increase by a flat amount. I'm sure somebody uses them. <laughs> uh... Okay, so here we see that we have three different modules that all increase your resistances to EM. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Layered armor coatings and layered energized armor coatings are the same thing. Just energized armor, uh, layered energized armor membranes increase by more and take more fitting. We'll talk about that in a second. We're looking at, uh, sorry, I missed this one. There we go. Here's the three types. Woo! All right. So we have, in order of power, the EM armor coating, fully passive. takes zero CPU usage and is there a power grid? No, zero power grid. None of these take any power grid. So an EM coating takes, sorry, one teraflop or megawatt. One megawatt. That's it for the entire coating. So this, if you have zero fitting, a coating will work. Energized membrane, also passive, but as you can see, better, like half again is better, 19% versus 27%. However, you can see that it has a 25 uh, teraflop CPU consumption. That's a, that's a lot more than zero. So if you can't fit anything, or if you can't fit it, you would go with a coating. And if you can, if you do have the fitting, you would go with an energized membrane. So far, so good. The hardener, just like the shield hardener, is the active module of the two. So an, uh, an armor hardener only works while it's active, consumes power, 30 gigajoules every 20 seconds, 
However, increases your resistances by significantly more than both of the others. So this will really help your resistances as long as it's activated and does nothing for you as long as it's not active. These will always do something for you. And let's go back to those skills again. If we look at the compensation skills, it says armor coatings and energized platings. That is these two. Armor coating. Armor coating. Energized armor mem membrane. So these two passive modules are affected by your compensation skills. This active hardener, just like with shields, is not. Don't active uh, hardeners even give a little, uh, little bit of resistances even when they're off? I don't think so. So, again, active hardeners, larger amount, need to be active, larger consumption. Passive, you would use a coating if you just can't fit anything, and you'd use an energized if you can. Now, when it comes to energized, in particular, there is a very famous module. Not only can you have, uh, hi, not only can you have these type specific hardeners, but you can also have multi-spectrum hardeners. I forgot this in Shields. Shields has this too. So a multi-spectrum hardener, uh, a multi-spectrum energy energized membrane will give you passively 12% on everything. Right? But it won't give you, so it doesn't give you as much as a type hardener, but it gives you good for everything. Also, we can compare this to the damage control, and we can see that, uh, first of all, if you notice this bonus, it doesn't, it doesn't count these as the same. The damage control doesn't have these bonuses. This is why the damage control can stack and doesn't cause diminishing returns. Because the bonus that makes the um, the damage control work is different than the bonus that makes the membranes and the hardeners work. So, uh, likewise, I can look at the uh, kinetic armor hardening. Didn't I click it? Uh, so, a damage control does 10 where a membrane does 12, but a membrane will give it, it will have diminishing returns with itself and other hardeners, where a damage control will not. Uh, okay. In addition to that, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the shield hardeners, or the armor hardeners have two advantages over shields, though. While the shields do have a multi-spectrum hardener, they do not have a passive multi-spectrum. Right? So, while the armor has no active hardener that's multi-spectrum, but does have passive modules that are multi-spectrum. Which also should mean that these modules, these passive multi-spectrums, are enhanced by your armor skills, your compensation skills, while the shield multi-spectrum is not. That's an interesting thing. In addition to that, armor gets what's referred to as the reactive armor hardener. The reactive armor hardener is really cool. Basically, it starts out at 15% across the board. Um, and then every cycle, 
it will take in all of the damage that you have taken within that last cycle and then attempt to adjust your resistances to compensate to the actual damage that you have taken. Uh, so what this means is, is that it, well, first of all, if you're taking only one type of damage, then it'll shift all of its resistance power to that one type of damage. If you're taking two types of damage, then it will split its resistance profile 50-50 between those two types of damage. If you're taking three or four types of damage, however, it will take the proportion of how much of each damage type you are taking and adjust your resistances accordingly. Such that, like I said, it will plug a hole, for example, right? So if they're doing even damage, but you don't have even resistances, it will begin to compensate for the resistance that you don't have. Now, each cycle is about 10 seconds long. This gets increased by bonuses. Um, I don't think this says it here. But the shift, it doesn't shift instantly all at once. It can only shift so much at one time. So, uh, yeah, it spreads its 60% re uh, resistance over the four damage types. Which means if you're taking one damage type it can shift that entire 60% to that one damage type, which is really, really good. And then if you start taking another damage type, it will cycle over to the other side, but it takes some time. Shield resistance amplifiers are uh, affected, and they got higher resistances and higher energized armor ones. Right, but aren't it, uh, there's no multi-spectrum shield resistance amplifier, right? Um... So the reactive armor hardener is one of my favorite. Uh, yeah, it goes. It's it's about three cycles for it to go from one extreme to the other. So it actually reacts pretty quickly. Um, and I just love to. Uh, this is one of my favorite modules because not only does it help with all kinds of different resistance profiles, but you can actually hover over the module while it's running to see which resistances it is shifted to. So that way you can know, like, you know, if I've got a ton of incoming damage and it's all different kinds, uh, I can hover over it and see, oh, while I am taking some EM damage, it's so low that it's like shifted over to something to explosive. Oh, OK, well, these enemies are mostly doing explosive. Now, granted, that might be a me thing because I'm trying to figure out these things so that way I can talk to you guys about it. Um, but, yeah, I use this all the time for that purpose. Is that it? Is that it for armor? All right. Well, I'm running low on time, so let's keep on going. Uh, for shields, we have shield flux coils, shield power relays. Uh, sorry, shield flux coils and shield power relays. We're actually going to talk about those separately. Uh, next, weapons upgrades. So each weapon system has their own weapons upgrade. And rather than going through them all separately, we'll just look at uh, two of them for now, or three of them for now. Show info. Show info. Show info. No, 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 not show info. Compare. 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 Okay, so here is the missile the Entropic Disintegrator, and the Gyro Stabilizer, which would be the projectile um, bonuses, okay? We can see that the Entropic Disintegrator gives a larger bonus, but a smaller rate of fire bonus. This is because, like I said, you don't necessarily want your Entropic Disintegrators to be uh, cycling faster, because that also lets them ramp faster. However, uh, for the gyro and the ballistic, it gives you an 8% bonus by default. And then likewise, it also increases your missile damage. And it, of course, it, it increases. The, so it increases damage and your rate of fire for whichever it is that you're using. And uh, yeah, so pretty simple. And the CPU usage of ballistic control systems are just higher than turrets. This is simple. You just use the correct one for the weapon type that you're using. They all look the same. 
So if you're like me, you almost always get it wrong and then somebody make fun of you for it. You've got gyro stabilizers for the projectiles. You've got magno uh, magnetic stabilizer. Mag uh, we call them mag stab. Hold on. Magnetic field stabilizers for projectiles. And we have uh, uh, heat sinks for lasers. In addition to that, we have tracking enhancers and missile guidance enhancers. These are both basically the same as their mid-slot equivalent, the guidance computer and the tracking computer, in the fact that it increases your application and your range. However, it is a significantly smaller amount than uh, the tech two or then the mid slot equivalent. So let's look at this. Remove. I still have this one, so we'll go with that. Guidance. Oh, that's a guidance disruptor. Phooey. Tracking enhancer. Tracking computer. Okay. So if we look, tracking speed, the tracking computer, which is the mid slot, is better. The uh, range, optimal range, is better. Wait, hold on. Nope. That's kind of cool. I didn't know that. The tracking enhancer actually has a higher optimal range bonus. And a lower tracking speed bonus. Huh. See? I even learned things. Um, and then, likewise, it also has a... Should have a fall-off. Yeah. Fall-off bonus. And it has a higher follow-up bonus. So tracking enhancer will actually increase your range a lot better, while tracking computer will help your tracking speed bonus better. Now, the other thing about uh, tracking enhancers are that, first of all, tracking enhancers are uh, not an activated module. They're a passive module, whereas the uh, enhancers are active. Oops. Whatever. Uh... And as you can see, it's also not scripted, right? So while the mid slot one can be scripted between the two, the low slot one is just what it is. Likewise, drone damage amplifier is basically the same thing for drones. Now, the only electronic warfare benefit it has uh, in the electronic warfare category is a single disruption amplifier. This literally, all this does is amplify the, uh, this is one of the things that amplifies the jam strength of your jam module. So like a Caldari ship or, you know, any sort of ship with a jam ECM, the actual ECM EWAR, uh, this will increase its chance of being successful. Okay. And also its range. All right, so next is the fitting pieces. You have, uh, or rather, whatever. We have the coprocessor. The coprocessor just gives you extra CPU at the cost of power grid, right? So, actually, not even with, for power grid. It just gives you CPU for a slot, I suppose I should say. So if you're over on CPU, a coprocessor is a good way to do that. You sacrifice a low slot, but depending on what it is, you can just, uh, you know, it, it may be a good idea. Signal amplifiers are much like sensor boosters, which I think I might have skipped with mid-slots. But sensor boosters are just like sensor disruptors, where they increase your scan resolution, and, uh, and which speeds up how fast you can lock, and your targeting range, which speeds up how far you can lock. Signal amplifiers, likewise, uh, increase your maximum targeting range and increase your scan resolution. Let's also compare these, because I, I found out so much new, like I found out something fun last time. So let's go ahead and uh, signal... Signal amplifier and hold on. Sensor booster, that's right.
Ah, signal amplifier increases your maximum lock targets, too. That's kind of interesting. That's something I didn't know. Um, so as you can see, the sensor booster activates when the signal amplifier doesn't, just like the others. Um, and that also means they can be overheated and scripted. Uh, but the scan resolution strength is twice as good for a sensor booster, unscripted. And the... Maximum lock range is the same? Is that correct? Let's double check that. Maximum targeting lock range 25%. 25%. Yeah, so they both have the same increase to maximum targeting range bonus, but way more scan resolution bonus to the mid slot than the sensor amplifier, but the sensor amplifier also increases your maximum targeting by one. Of course, as we said earlier, you still need to have the skills to be able to lock that many. That's true. There is a uh, there is a high slot signal amplifier that, well, oh, right, there's a passive targeter that, but whatever. That just lets you target somebody without them noticing that you're targeting them. Uh... <clears throat> Moving on. Okay, let's talk capacitor and power. Nope, let's let, we're going to save that for last. Uh, so let's talk about speed. You have inertial stabilizers. And you have... Where is it? Where is it? You have overdrive injectors. And... Hull upgrades? I thought it was here. Oh, yeah, there it is. You're right. And a nano fiber. Okay. So all three of these slot are low slots, and all of them make you go faster. Right now, the inertial stabilizer doesn't actually make you go actually faster, but it just makes you more agile. Okay, the overdrive injector will make you a lot faster, and the nanofiber will make you a little bit faster, but that's only the start. Next, the inertia modifier this is where things get uh, so inertia is countered, agility and inertia are against each other. The higher your agility, the fat, the faster you can change your vector, i.e. speed and direction. And the higher the inertia, the slower you can change your speed and direction. So these not only... So the nanofiber not only allows you to go faster, but allows you to get faster faster. Whereas the initial st inertial stabilizer does not let you go faster, but makes you get faster way faster. The overdrive injector system makes you go the fastest but does not make you get to your top speed any faster. Now, when you're getting into warp, the way warp works is that the first tick in which you are over 70% of your speed in the correct vector of your warp target, you go. Which means if your warp speed is under two seconds, then you can actually warp before an opponent can lock you and scram you. This is called unlockable. Or insta warp. Um, as you can see, like reducing your inertial modifier is the secret here, right? The the more you can reduce your inertial modifier and increase your agility, the faster you'll be able to get into warp. So you would see this and say, okay, well, the inertial modifier from the inertial stabilizer feels better. I should use inertial stabilizers. But there's two, there's another piece to this, which is this your signature radius modifier. This signature radius modifier increases your signature radius in the same way that like a shield extender would. So what this means is, is that while an inertial stabilizer can make you insta-warp uh, more effectively, if it fails to, then it's actually easier and faster for your opponent to lock you. So if you move your warp speed from like five seconds to four seconds, that may actually not help you 
because now you've made it. So they've gone from six seconds to four seconds to lock you or whatever. It's sub two. Sub, uh, if you're under two seconds, then you're basically un, ungrabbable. Because the first second is locking you and the second second to activate. By that point, you're already in warp. Inertia is okay to use with a BS or a BC, but I wouldn't recommend it for a smaller size ship. Well, if you don't care about being locked and having that agility difference, like I said, if it brings you below two seconds, then outstanding. You know, if there's a lot of sub two second builds that use exactly that. Here, let me show you an example. This is one of those uh, special edition ships that we talked about earlier. This is the Sinesis. As you can see, I actually use it, or I, Fonsui, who made this build, I believe, uh, put an inertial stabilizer here because, let's turn off the micro warp drive, that's all that's needed to bring it below two second uh, alignment. A nanofiber would not. So in this case, the inertial stabilizer becomes the thing that makes it unscannable or un ungrabbable. In addition to that, the nanofiber in, uh, also, sorry, the overdrive injector system. I thought the nano, not, whatever. Overdrive injector system reduces your cargo capacity so you can carry less, even though you're going faster. And the nanofiber reduces your structure. So people will often use nanos and overdrive injectors in order to kite. But an overdrive injector would make it so that they have less cargo, they can carry less ammo, they can carry less cap charges, they can, you know, all that sort of stuff. A nanofiber reduces their structure, which means that they're faster, more agile, but they explode quicker when you grab them. Gotta go, gotta go. Uh... I think we're going to have to talk about shield flux coils and all that stuff next time. So we're going to finish up the low slots, go into rigs and uh, meta types and all that stuff tomorrow. We got covered a lot of ground today. I don't feel like we wasted any time, but unfortunately that's almost five hours right now and my son's getting home in like seven minutes. So uh, I'm going to have to come back tomorrow in order to finish this stuff. Uh, thank you guys for watching. For this long um thank you to all the follows and and subs that came in uh sorry for not responding to them in uh, at the time but of course you know i want to be able to keep this rolling uh, if you're watching it on youtube thank you for watching this long like comment subscribe all that sort of stuff that it really helps more than you think uh for those of you who are here you can always check out our live you can check out my youtube at that link uh, if you want to support what I do, this is what I do. Um, for some reason, I've been able to do this for a few years, thanks to you guys. Thanks to you, in part, mostly because of the patrons that I have. So uh, go ahead and check out my Patreon if you're interested in joining that team that support me and get access to uh, some of my behind-the-scenes stuff. Um, if Otherwise, you can always just subscribe on uh, Twitch using normal sub or prime sub. Get all those cool emotes. Uh, you can always just donate directly through YouTube if you, or sorry, uh, PayPal, if you really feel like it. Uh, thank you for that cheer. Um, but yeah, uh, honestly, just go check out my YouTube channel, check out those videos, check out the old work and stuff. I put a lot of work into some of those, especially like the ancient, uh, the, uh, who are the Triglavian videos and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, this is a little bit odd. I am a game developer, so... If you wouldn't mind checking it out, I have my own puzzle game that I made uh, called Playton. It's a real-time puzzle game. It's a matchmaking game. Uh, maybe I'll show it off tomorrow when we have more time. But it's totally free if you go to that link. Check it out. If you like it, let me know. Uh, let your friends know. And let people know about my show and my stream and all that kind of stuff. Thank you, guys. That's how this works.